Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this brand new episode of the podcast called The Dictionary, and I am doing a TikTok video, and I have a very creepy Joker face. Maybe I'll have to do this as a costume someday. But the mouth is eh, weird. The first word in this episode is desiderate. D e s i d e r a t e. It is a transitive verb from 1645. To entertain or express a wish to have or attain. A desideration is a noun, desiderative, desiderative, adjective. It's from the Latin desiderare, which means to desire, and there's more at the word desire. <laughs> Let's stop this video and click these buttons, and then we're going to post it with all of the necessary hashtags, or like five of them, because that's what we got to do. Yes, we want to post it publicly. Why wouldn't we want to post it publicly? Desiderate. I don't know if I'm familiar with this desiderate word. It's all about desire. To entertain or express a wish to have or attain. So if you're just thinking about or telling somebody, telling yourself, telling somebody about a thing that you want, then you are desiderating. We don't use this anymore. Who uses this? Maybe very fancy, smart writers and poets, maybe. Yeah, I think the sound effect today is just going to be... Ha 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 The next word is desideratum. Desideratum or desideratum or desider desideratum. Des this is of all the, all the variations. Desideratum. Noun from 1652, this is something desired as essential. So I think that means that if you, if you feel like in your life there is something that is essential, that you really, really need this thing, and it is essential for you to keep on going as a human, then that thing would be the desideratum. I think it is. So, uh, yeah, same, similar etymology from desiderare, to desire, to desire. What do you desire? What is your most essential desire? Ha 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 ha. The next word is design, D-E-S-I-G-N, and we have two forms, and between the two of them, they take up probably more than half of this whole episode. So let's just read all the stuff about design. This first form is the verb from the 14th century, starting with transitive, one, to create, fashion, execute, or construct according to plan. And the synonyms are devise and contrive. So there's a plan, and then you Build, create, make, fashion, execute all the ways that you can make a thing from the plan and you are you're designing it. Uh, I to construct according to plan. So in this case, it seems like the plan comes first. But when I think of design, I think of you are creating the plan as you are designing. That's the way that I think of that. But either way, you're making the stuff from your brain. To A, to conceive, here we go, to conceive and plan out in the mind. In the mind, you are conceiving of a plan, and then you are pl making the plan, the planning it out, the plan, plan the plan, as in, he designed the perfect crime. Well, it was all in his head, in his mind, but was it really perfect? Did he follow through with this crime just because you design it doesn't mean that it's true. To be. To have as a purpose. The synonym is intend, as in, she designed to excel in her studies. To have as a purpose. So she intended to excel in her studies. She Her purpose was to excel in her studies. Yeah, I don't know if I've heard design used in this context. It's a new one for me. 
and I will I shall promptly forget it. To see to devise for a specific function or end, as in a book designed primarily as a college textbook. What is it designed for secondarily? A kindergarten textbook? I don't know if they can read the same books. <laughs> uh, to devise for a specific function or end, a very specific purpose. After it's been designed, you come up with it in your mind, and then it has a very specific purpose. Number three is archaic. To indicate with a distinctive mark, sign, or name. To indicate with a distinctive... So, some sort of distinct mark, sign, or name. When you put down that mark, maybe it's a check mark. I'm not sure what kind of mark. You put it down, and then you, you have designed. But, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that's definitely an old way to, to use this word. I do feel like anything that's archaic or obsolete, they really should put it at the end. Because we have 4A, to make a drawing, pattern, or sketch of. Of a, just of a, of a stuff. A draw, draw a thing, a pattern, a sketch. But you are creating it. And that's the design part. I am, I am not a good visual designer uh, I just, I can't, I'm like, the, the, my sim simple stuff in my brain. Um, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not great at coming up with, like, interesting colors, patterns, shapes, how to lay it all, I don't, I don't know, my brain just doesn't quite work that way. I am a visual person, but, yeah, something, something just stops my brain at that point. 4B, to draw the plans for, as in, design a building, and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would assume that this is similar to, uh, what was it, number 2A, conceive and plan out in the mind. So you'd have to design the building in your mind first, but then drawing the plans, that's design. That's, this is for, like, architects. Same with 4A, to make a drawing pattern or sketch of, architects are definitely designing buildings, plans. Um, intransitive time, it is is in transitive time one to conceive or execute a plan two to draw lay out or prepare a design how do you prepare a design are you getting all of your tools ready to go oh what was that word that i just learned from like two different places i think where what we do in the shadows was one of them and then somebody else it was like the idea the art of laying things out ahead of time I don't remember what that word was. Designedly, designedly is an adverb. It's a Middle English word, which means to outline or to indicate or to mean. Uh, from Anglo-French, designer, which means to designate. From Middle Latin, designare, which is to mark out which is from de plus signare, which means to mark. So when you put in the de at the beginning, it becomes to mark out. And then it became to designate, and then to outline, indicate, mean. Uh, there's more at the word sign, S-I-G-N. So that was all of the things that anybody could ever say about the first form of the word design. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's other things. I'm trying to be a little bit better about, should I chat more about these things? Or just about the word in general? If something pops in my mind, obviously I'm going to say it, but I'm sure there's a lot of things that I just can't even think of in the moment. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. We have another word. Ha ha ha. I've done this laughing thing a lot, and I saw that joker face on the TikTok, so I thought, oh, I'll do a, a ha ha sound effect. Ha 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 but I got to do something. I got to change it up. The second form of design is a noun from 1569. 1A, a particular purpose held in view by an individual or group, as in, he has ambitious designs for his son. Maybe you should just let your son live his life in whatever way that he wants to and don't design his life for him because he may not want to go that path. And he may think he wants to go to another path, a different one, 
and then he might change his mind at some point. We don't know how life goes. So is a particular purpose held in view by an individual or group? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Number 1B. Deliberate purpose... Purposive? Purposive? What is that word? Deliberate purposive planning. As in, more by accident than design. So yeah, if you design a thing, you are... It's a very... It's purposeful and you've planned it, and it's deliberate, that's what a design is. But in this context, in this e- example, uh, something happened just by accident. You have to allow for accidents, because they are going to happen. Sometimes, maybe more often than not, maybe all the time, it's actually better that way. You can you can design your life and things all you want, but sometimes it just doesn't go to plan. Two, a mental project or scheme in which means to an end are laid down. A mental project or scheme. So, again, it's all in the mind. You're designing a thing in your brain. But then when it's all put into plan, all put into actual reality, uh, that is when it is the design in the noun form. Yes. Design the plan for the perfect crime maybe that guy went ahead and did it and it was the perfect crime and he's never been caught so he designed his plans and then performed the design i don't know if that's how you would say that 3a a deliberate undercover project or scheme synonym is plot 3b is plural aggressive or evil intent And this is used with the words on or against, as in, he has designs on the money. Hmm. Aggressive or evil intent. So he's going to do something bad with the money. He's going to take the money, probably. Keep it for himself. And uh, designs? What other context would you use this and against? Designs against a thing? I mean, again, it's all the same thing. It's it's just coming up with a plan. Plan. Four. A preliminary sketch or outline showing the main features of something to be executed, as in the design for the new stadium. All of those HGTV shows show the plans, the designs of how the architects, the designers, yeah, is right there in their name, the designers, they want to make it look like this. And so they make up the design on the computer and then they show the people and they're like, oh my God, this is so cute. This is exactly my style. You hit the nail on the head. You got it right. That's exactly what I want. And then they go to put the design in plan in place and then they can do it most of the time. It's often, often, and this is definitely not planned ahead of time. It's not designed ahead of time. They're like, oh, hey. We, we Maybe we can do this. Can we add this? Can we change this halfway through? Oh, yeah, let's do that. We'll figure it out. And they do it. Or sometimes they run into a problem. See, that's the accident. You can't plan for those accidents. And then they just got to figure it out and adjust. 5A, an underlying scheme that governs functioning, developing, developing or unfolding. Synonyms are pattern and motif, as in... The general design of the epic. It's the underlying scheme that controls everything else. The scheme of the epic. What sort of epic is this? A story epic? 5B. A plan or protocol for carrying out or accomplishing something as a scientific experiment. You have to design, you have to plan out your experiment before you actually do it. You have to come up with just the the plan. What are you going to do first? What are you going to do second? What are you going to do third? What if things go that way? Maybe you got to come up with a plan for that. So yeah, you got to design the experiment. And then also for this definition, the process of preparing this. So the process of preparing the design, the plan, is the design But then when you actually do it, you have a design. You have to probably write out the design and the the plan and say, what am I going to do? First, second, third, 
put it all down so you can follow it. You can maybe check off, you can make a checklist and check them off as they go. Oh, six. Oh, six, you have arrived. The arrangement of elements or details in a product or work of art. How is this art, photos, text, uh, other abstract things, when how are they put all together? It is a design. You have designed the elements to look in a certain way for, oh, I don't know, say a magazine uh, cover or image or something. Seven. A decorative pattern, as in a floral design. It's such such a pretty design. Your wallpaper is wonderful. If you scratch it and lick it, you can do that. Eight, the creative art of executing aesthetic or functional designs. A synonym for everything, two of them, intention and plan. What is your intention? What is your plan? Do it, plan it, make it happen. No etymology for this one because we talked about it in the last one. Ha ha ha. The next word is designate. First form, it could also be pronounced designate. Adjective from 1629, chosen but not yet installed, as in ambassador designate. And I feel like in this case it would be designate and not designate, although it maybe it could be designate. Uh, so the ambassador has been chosen, but is, they haven't installed him into his chair or her into their chair Oh, uh, the etymology is looking like it's from designar. Yeah, that's the same as the previous word for design. So it's like marking a thing. You're saying this is the th- this this is a thing, but it's not in place yet. Ho 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 ho! The next word is the second form, and this one is pronounced designate. No other pronunciations are allowed. This is a verb. I believe it is only transitive from 1639. So what do we we had 1639, 1629, 1569, 14th century, 1652. We just had a lot in the 1600s in this episode. Number one for designate, to indicate and set apart for a specific purpose, office, or duty. As in, designate a group to prepare a plan. It's funny, you have designated a group and they are going to design a plan. Design, all the things are being designated. Uh, When I have a guest on, which I will relatively soon, hoping to have a bunch of guests actually soon, but uh, when I have a guest, we have to uh, designate a section. Well, usually we designate a section of one of these pages to, to be set aside for, for them to uh, talk about with me, for me to read, and them, and them, they, them they will chatter with me. Okay, number 2A for designate. To point out the location of. To point out the location of, as in a marker designating the battle. Where was the battle? Just look at for the marker. Where's the marker? There's the marker. It's uh, designating that the battle took place right here under our feet. And, uh, oh, yeah, there's, there's that. Yep, markers. Markers designating things. I don't know what else to say about that. I have little post-it notes in this book, and they designate what uh, what days each of the episodes on that page will air. So my little post-it note says that this episode is airing on November 9th. The next definition for designate is to be, to distinguish as to class, as in the area we designate as that of spiritual values. And that is a quote from J.B. Conant. To distinguish as to class. Hmm... So is that like to class, to classify, to put, you're you're designating a thing to classify into a category? So the quote is, the area we designate 
as that of spiritual values. So this area has some spiritual value to to us, to that group, whoever it is, and so uh, we're designating it as a spiritual place. I, I'm that's my guess on that example. To see synonyms are specify and stipulate, as in to be sent by a designated shipper. What kind? Which shipper? Is it FedEx? Is it the USPS? Is it UPS? Is it one of those other ones that I can't think of? But uh, they they they're chosen. The shipper has been chosen, designated to ship the thing. Three, synonym is denote, as in, associate names with the people they designate. Or is it associate names? Associate names with the people they designate. I do feel like these examples are getting a little bit weird. I think they can be simplified to help out with the understanding of a definition, but uh, denote, 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 denote. Four, to call by a distinctive title, term, or expression, as in a particle designated the neutron. That particle, we have called it the neutron. That is its title. Maybe it's Mrs. Neutron or Dr. Neutron. Dr. Neutron. Designative is an adjective, designator is a noun, and designatory, designatory, that is an adjective. No etymology. <laughs> the next word is designated driver. Two words, noun from 1982, a person chosen to abstain from intoxicants as alcohol so as to transport others safely who are not abstaining. Those people, there's a group of people who are not abstaining from intoxicants, particularly alcohol, so they have chosen to ingest the alcohol so they get very silly and loopy and they really should not be driving, really at all. So that is why there is, should be, Often is, but not as often as maybe there should be. There should be a designated driver, one who is not enjoying the intoxicant, so they can stay sober and drive the people around, transport them in whatever whatever vehicle they have. It could be a car. It could be a truck. It could be a bike. It could be a tricycle. That's what I want to see. Uh, I have been many times the designated driver. And maybe we'll talk more about that later. Ho 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 ha 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 Designated hitter is next. Two words, noun from 1973. One, a baseball player designated at the start of the game to bat in place of the pitcher without causing the pitcher to be removed from the game. As long as they designate this before the game actually starts. Why is this? Are the pitchers not usually as good uh, at batting as the other people? And so they're like, well, that's a that's a good hitter over there. So I'll have them hit for me. But then I will still run the bases because I'm a, I'm a great base runner, but I'm a crappy hitter. Designated hitter. You got to be designated ahead of time. Number two, synonyms are representative and substitute. They're coming in to help out. doesn't have to be baseball. You can just substitute somebody and you can still be called a designated hitter. We have to reread the words real quick so we can pick a word of the episode we had today. Desiderate, desideratum, design, design, designate or designate, designate, designated driver, and designated hitter. I have to pick designated driver as the word of the episode because this is a highly important job and a lot of people who very much enjoy the intoxicants, they don't want this job, but sometimes you just have to do it so your friends can still have a good time. Take one for the team. Maybe if you all enjoy the intoxicants and you have a group of people, maybe the uh, designated driver needs to rotate around or maybe you just do a random thing 
And uh, maybe it's a computer program. Maybe it's you just grab somebody's keys out of a bowl or something, whatever it is. Going out as a group, come up with a designated driver. The, uh, the whole Uber Lyft thing has really changed this. People don't uh, need to come up with a designated driver. They just have to pay for one. If they're willing to and they can, they can just pay for a designated driver. It's their job. Yeah, one time I was, uh, what? let's see, I was waiting for some people, sitting in a parking lot. My car lights were pointing into somebody's window, so I turned them off. I was the designated driver. Everybody piled into the car, and we drove about two blocks, and I realized that my lights were still off. So I turned on my lights, and I got pulled over pretty quickly. And uh, they, uh, they pulled me over, and I had not been drinking, and I was the designated driver. And they were like, well, have you been drinking? No. Will you take a, a, the, the blow test thing? And I said, yes, I will. And of course, I passed it. And they said, why do I smell alcohol? And somebody behind me said, that's me, because they had already been drinking. Um, please, please, please be responsible. First of all, don't drink and drive. Second of all, maybe just don't drink, because it's, it's just rough. And um, what else? Be And if you are going to drink and go out, uh, make sure that you have somebody else driving because you will not be aware of how badly you are driving. Please, 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 please do not ever do this. This is one of the worst possible things that you can ever do. I cannot state this enough. I'm sure you've already heard this many times. Whoever you are, just don't do it. Do not do it. Okay designated driver they're a really important person in the world this is not a song if you're gonna go out drinking come up with a designated driver they are be really nice to them because they're helping you get real drunk no please don't do that no i mean you can if you want but just be responsible and smart and do things within your limits We love you, designated drivers. Wow, this really fell off the rails. Okay, let's end it and start a new episode. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. What do we have in store for you today? Oh, you know, just a whole bunch of other words. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I am recording this the day after Halloween and uh so you know there's it was a lot of fun uh seeing what people dressed up as i hope to see more pictures on social media today uh my dad did dress up sort of he said this is spencer um when he is done with this podcast and so he happened to have one of my t-shirts because he bought one and you can buy one too over at t public the link is in the show notes and uh so he had the shirt on and He was like, what am I going to dress up as? I know, I'll do Spencer when he's done. And he had a white wig, and he put a white wig on, and he painted his face to look all old and wrinkled. And uh, and that that was his costume, and I posted it. I think I posted it on Instagram, so if you want to see that, go over there, at DictionaryPod, and see what I will look like in 20 years. The first word in this episode is designation. Noun from the 14th century... 1. The act of indicating or identifying. Number 2. Appointment to or selection for an office, post, or service. You have been designated. 3. A distinguishing name, sign, or title. What what should my designation be? I don't have one. I mean, there's the standard, like, mister and those things but you know are there more fun things i didn't go to school to become a doctor or anything like that but uh yeah i don't know we we need more options for for names and titles i mean obviously there's the uh dictionary boy dictionary man that's a i'm sure people will call me that one if they haven't already four the relation between a sign and the thing signified so the relation so there's there's a thing but then there's a sign for that thing so the relation between them the relationship i don't know if you could say that 
is the designation. The sign is designating a thing. Oh, and the sound effect today will just be... Hmm. The next word is... Designy. Now, is that really how you would say that? Or would you say... Designy? Designy? Designy. Designy. I think that's it. Noun from 1925... One that is designated is the designee, and the opposite of that would be our next word, hmm, designer. First form, noun from 1662, it's just one that designs, but there is an A and a B, so more specifically, one that designs as A, one who creates and often executes plans for a project or structure, as in urban designers, also as in a theater set designer. There are so many designers, fashion designers, graphic designers, building designers. The list just goes on so much longer than you could think of. There's probably dictionary designers, aren't there? other designers they just design b one that creates and manufactures a new product style or design especially one who designs and manufactures high fashion clothing as in the designer's new fall line you know it's they they make um they make the the designs the fashion but then it's like out of style within a year maybe a few months because every season has new designs so they got to keep up with demand of what's the new thing you're making but there's also this creates and manufactures a product and i think about this sometimes and it just kind of blows my brain every single thing that you buy at the store whatever it is it has been designed somebody had to think of it and then create it and make it and then make a whole bunch of them so people could buy it and um you know for us like consumers who don't really do that thing you're just like oh cool a thing i like it but we don't really think about the person behind it who who had to make it and come up with the thing and uh, you know could be a team of people could be a single person whatever it is but i'm just looking around in my bedroom and we have all these sort of decorative things and other other items like an air conditioner somebody had to design the air conditioner what it looks like how you put all the pieces together and i don't know i just think it's good to uh just just take a step back and be like somebody made that think about the person who did that thing they had to make the pattern for the thing they had to come up with how to physically put a thing together i don't know i just think I, I'm just really, really, really impressed with designers who are making stuff like that. The next word. Hmm. Designer again. Second form. Adjective from 1966. One. Of, relating to, or produced by a designer. As in, designer wallpaper. So it's not just... Well, when I hear designer wallpaper, designer something else, I think, oh, it's, it's the real, real fancy because somebody, somebody designed it. But what about the other things? Like, it's isn't it all designer wallpaper? Unless it's like a flat color, the, it had to be designed by somebody. But you always, you always hear when you put designer before a thing, it becomes much more expensive and fancy. Designer wallpaper. I don't think I'll ever get designer wallpaper unless I design it. Also is in wearing a designer original. It's nobody else has it. It's 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 a unique thing that has been designed and you are wearing it. There is more to this definition displaying the name, signature or logo of a designer or manufacturer. A lot of people do this they wear a thing that all the only image on the thing is a logo or the name of the thing who made it so we're just we're just advertising for the company that made the thing that we are wearing 
a shirt. You know, there's so many shirts that have just the logo. That's it. Like, I love this company so much. Do you, though? Do you really love that company, that designer, that person, that whatever it is? What's what's so special about them that you have to, that you are deciding to advertise for them as you wear that item of clothing all day? Is, uh, do you, why, why do people do this? Is it a status thing? I don't really understand it. I don't, I just, I don't, I mean, I must have something like that, but I don't know. There's always, there's, there's things that you don't think about. You know, my phone, it's, it's a, it's a branded phone. So there's that, but there's, yeah, I don't know. That's just what I think about. Um, okay. Wearing the example for that one was designer jeans. You're wearing the jeans because you like the jeans and you probably therefore then like the company. Was it Levi's? Is it something else? Is it is it showing your butt in the right way? Is it, are they comfortable? Are they comfortable? First and foremost, are they comfortable? I think they gotta be. Same with shoes. Two, intended to reflect the latest in sophisticated taste or fashion, as in designer ice cream, also is in a designer haircut. What are the latest trends in ice cream? What is the new thing? There's there's always every feels like every year there's a new flavor, a new scent, not just with ice cream, but with everything. With, you know, just the candles and whatever. So uh yeah. And but it's gotta be sophisticated taste. Oh, I have sophisticated taste, so I can't eat that ice cream, but I can eat designer ice cream. Why is it designer ice cream? Who, somebody had to design this ice cream and make the, the the tasty flavor. I don't know if I'll ever get a designer haircut. I just don't feel cool enough to do that. Three, modified artificially, as by genetic engineering, to fulfill individual specifications or meet a need, as in designer foods, also as in designer estrogens. I didn't know you could do that with estrogen, but definitely food. Uh, the example that my brain always goes to for genetically modified food or designer food is, um, I think it was a rice that was genetically modified so it could grow better in certain conditions so more people could be fed, which is a good thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, other designer foods. I'm trying to think of other examples modified artificially hmm 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 yeah i think there's a lot of things kind of like that rice example um but now i just want to see you know food with the logo of a of an apparel company on it or something like that that would be a designer food next hmm designer drug two words noun from 1983 a synthetic version of a controlled substance, like heroin, that is produced with a slightly altered molecular structure to avoid having it classified as an illicit drug. And this is fascinating to me. Um, it does make sense that it has to be slightly altered, but how is it altered? Is it, is it, I mean, clearly it seems to be not altered enough to be so different from the original controlled controlled substance like heroin or cannabis that's another one that i think has has a uh, designed version of it um so if just because it's made and it's slightly different it, it is not considered an illicit drug i feel like i heard that for cannabis there's an there's a, a a version made in the lab but i don't i feel like i heard that it's not slightly altered it must be legally has to be slightly altered, but I don't know if it is. I think they have they have enough of the same molecular structure, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess if it's a little bit different, it's not the same thing, and it's not going to be on the Controlled Substances Act thing list. Um, designer drug. There's a lot of these. I don't know a lot about them other than what I just said. They're design. They sound so much fancier, right? They sound uh, sound like if you're getting a designer drug, then you are in the upper echelons of, of classes of people, but not necessarily. 
Ooh. The next word is designing. Designing women. Adjective from 1653. One, practicing forethought. So think, thinking ahead. Not thinking behind. You're thinking ahead. You're planning. We, we talked all about that with design in the previous episode. Practicing forethought. You are designing. Two, synonyms are crafty and scheming, as in the quote, falling into the snares of a designing enemy. And that is from Charles Dickens. So I guess in this context, uh, the enemy designed something. They designed a trap, a snare. And then the, uh, the other people, they fell into those snares that the enemy had designed. Ooh. The next word is designment. It is a, a tasty mint that has been created and designed. Noun from 1583, it is obsolete. Designment is obsolete. The synonyms are plan and purpose. It's a design mint. They're like, we just, we don't need the word mint at the end. It's just a design. No more design words. Let's move on to something else. Ooh. Dezipramine. Dezipramine. That is the next word. Noun from 1965. It is a tricyclic antidepressant. C18, H22, N2. And, uh, yeah, it's from desmethyl and imipramine. What? Imipramine. So, yeah, we just took portions of those and put them all together and made desipramine. Ooh. The next word is desirability. Noun from 1824. Number one is plural. Desirable conditions. That would be desirabilities because it's plural. What are the conditions that are desirable? There's an example. Had understood and studied certain desirabilities. And that is from D. D. Eisenhower. Dwight D. Eisenhower. What was his middle name? I'm not sure. Dwight, is it Delano? No, that's Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Dwight, maybe it's Dwight Dwight. That would be fantastic. Dwight Dwight Eisenhower. It is now canon. Desirable conditions. Number two, the quality, fact, or degree of being desirable. What is the desirability of that thing? Why is it desirable? How much desirability is it? That depends on how much people want it. The next word, ooh, desirable. First form, adjective from the 14th century. So if a thing is desirable, it has desirability. But how much desirability is the question that we are all constantly asking ourselves. Number one for desirable, having pleasing qualities or properties. The synonym is attractive, as in a desirable woman. The, that, that example had no, no thought was put into it, I don't think. Um, having pleasing qualities or properties. Oh, that woman, her qualities are so pleasing to me. And her properties, hmm, properties uh, doesn't seem like a word that we should be using in, with that example. But, you know, technically it's correct. You got to have the definition be vague enough that it can cover all the bases. Number two, worth seeking or doing as advantageous, beneficial, or wise. The synonym is advisable, as in desirable legislation. So if this legislation is desirable, if people want it, we're going to advise that it happens. That means that it is worth seeking or doing. It, things, it, it will be advantageous to us if we put that legislation into place. So we, we want it. We desire it. It is desirable. Desirableness is a noun 
and desirably is an adverb. Oh, second form of desirable, noun from 1645, one that is desirable. You can call, if you desire a person, if they are desirable to you, you can call them a desirable, but uh, I don't know, I just, I think it's weird when words like that are used to, to talk about people. I hope this podcast is, is desirable to you. Is this a desirable podcast? Is it a desirable? Audrey, do you want to be let out of this room? Maybe you need to go use the bathroom. You desire to be out there. Okay, bye-bye. All right, we now have to get back to the words that we really, really want to talk about. We are desiring desiring to talk about these words oh like the word who desire first form verb from the 13th century starting with transitive uh yes one to long or hope for exhibit or feel desire for i feel like i added an, an extra syllable desire for As in, desire success. Everybody, I think, desires success. We just want to be happy, though, as well as successful. We want to feel like what we're doing is worthy. Uh, And we just long or hope for it oh so much. 2A, to express a wish for. Synonym is request. As in, they desire an immediate answer. They have requested you to answer them quite quickly. Please, please, please. We much, we must need it. We are longing or hoping for an immediate answer from you. To be is archaic. To express a wish to. To express a wish to. Synonym is ask. I am asking for an immediate response. Number three, obsolete. Synonym is invite. Four is archaic. To feel the loss of. Hmm, now that's interesting. To feel the loss of. You desire. Well, I guess you desire. So if somebody died, you are feeling the loss of them, uh, not in your life anymore, and you desire them to be back. You desire to have them back in your life. You desire to see them, talk to them, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, in this context, we don't really use it anymore. Hmm. Intransitive says to have or feel desire. This is, hmm. It's from the Latin desiderare, which is from de plus sider or sidus, which means heavenly body. So. The only thing that I can think of is that it's it's like metaphorically thing. If you desire a thing, you it's like it is a heavenly body. It's like so perfect and we look up to it. Oh, it's so wonderful. I desire for that to be into my life. And uh, I'm going to take it down from heaven and bring it to me. I desire it. But, you know, sometimes when you get the thing that you desire, it's not always what it's cracked up to be. There are synonyms. Oh, we haven't seen synonyms in a little bit. Let's talk about the synonyms for the word desire. Desire, wish, want, crave, and covet mean to have a longing for. I long for it. Desire stresses the strength of feeling and often implies strong intention or aim, as in desires... To start a new life. What what's wrong with the other life? What's gonna be different with the new life? It's it's time. Sometimes you just gotta start a new life. That's all there is. That's you got it. It just happens. Just do it. Do it. Wish sometimes implies a general or transient longing, especially for the unattainable, as in wishes. For permanent world peace. 
Yeah, I don't know if permanent world peace is possible, but we can all want it. We can wish for it. We can try. We can do things in our life to help bring along world peace. What does that mean exactly? Who? That's tricky. But we wish, we wish for it. Want. Want specifically suggests a felt need or lack, as in wants to have a family. They don't need to have a family. That's something different. They just want a family. Maybe another uh, adult person to share their life with or more than one. And then maybe some young people as well that they either create from their own bodies or they adopt from other places but they want a family. They want people to share their life with. Crave stresses the force of physical appetite or emotional need, as in craves sweets. Maybe when the person is making their family, maybe they're pregnant and their body is like, this is what I need right now. I am craving this food, this whatever it is. I don't have any experience with that whatsoever, but of course there's those typical things like weird flavors or weird flavor combinations, pickles and peanut butter and ice cream and all those things, and uh, that that that's crave. I don't feel, maybe I'm just not in touch with my body as much as some people, because I feel like there's some people who are like, ooh, I'm really craving this for dinner tonight. And when people ask me, I'm just like, whatever i'll just i'll take it all whatever you know if i like if i see pizza on a thing or if i think about it or if i smell it or whatever then i might crave it but uh but yeah normally i don't really get those it's just like just food food in front of me please now thank you covet implies strong envious desire as in covets his rise to fame It implies strong, envious desire. Oh, so this is somebody else coveting uh, his rise to fame. He had a rise to fame. He got all famous, and other people were like, ooh, I am so envious and jealous of your rise to fame. I covet that situation for myself. But you know what? You need to have your own situation. If you want your own rise to fame, you got to do your own thing if that's what you really want. If you desire, wish, want, crave, or covet, that. Do your thing. You be you. Please and thank you. Uh, We already talked about the etymology, but now we have to talk about the second form. Ooh. Second form of desire. Noun from the 14th century. One. Conscious impulse towards something that promises enjoyment or satisfaction in its attainment. Okay, what conscious impulse towards something that promises enjoyment or satisfaction? So once you get this thing, once you attain it, then it promises that you will have enjoyment, you will be satisfied because you got it, and you are very conscious that that will all happen. 2A. Synonyms are longing and craving. To be is sexual urge or appetite. So this is all about still about wanting a thing, but this is all about in a sexual way. You want a thing, a person, a whatever it is sexually or or just your appetite for the sexual things, your urges is desire. Three, a usually formal request or petition for some action. It's a desire. Hmm. I feel like I feel like formal and desire don't really go hand in hand. But I guess in uh, I guess in certain contexts, a formal request for a thing is called a desire. For something desired. If you if you desire a thing, that thing is called a desire. If you want this podcast, this podcast is a desire. And hey, you know what? You got it. It's here. You're going to have to wait until it's done, but it's here. Join me every day. The last word in this episode. Ooh. It is desirous. 
D-E-S-I-R-O-U-S, adjective from the 14th century, impelled or governed by desire, as in desirous of fame. Desirous, desirous of fame. So you are impelled or governed by desire. So I guess um, because you desire fame, you are impelled, compelled, you have to go do it. You have to go achieve it. That's what that means, desirous of fame. You just want it. You desire it. Desirously is an adverb, and desirousness, desirousness is a noun. Okay, that was the last word. We talked about desire and designing. Design, can you design desire? Maybe. The words today were designation, designee, designer, designer, designer drug, designing, designment, desipramine, desirability, desirable, desirable, desire, desire, and desirous. I, my brain doesn't even know what to do with all of these words that we just talked about. Um, let's see. Hmm. Hmm. Well, we did, we picked designated driver in the previous episode. Des, yeah, I don't know. I mean, none of these are really jumping out at me. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess, I guess, I don't know. Desire? We all desire things. We have to do things to get that thing into our life in some way. If that is what you desire, then as long as it's not hurting anybody, that's fine. Go for it. If you want some chocolate ice cream, if you desire it, if you crave it, just go get it. Go get it. Go get the things you desire. That's that song for desire. All right, that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Yay. Hello, hello, hello. How, I, I'm glad. I'm so glad you're here. I'm still so glad. Uh, let's just get right into it. The first word is desist or desist with a Z sound. Or the first syllable can be pronounced D instead of D. I like to say desist because I say this word so often. It is a N intransitive verb from the 15th century to cease, to proceed, or act. Synonym is the word stop. So it's anything that's just not happening anymore. It's not going forward, it's not proceeding, it's not acting, it's not, it's not uh, performing for your entertainment in any way. It has been desisted. Is that a word? Uh, desistance is a noun. This is from the Latin desistere, which is from de plus sistere, which means to stand or stop. Uh, akin to the verb stare, which means to stand. So it's like, oh, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking. Oh, nope, I'm stopping and I'm standing and I'm not walking anymore. I have desisted. I think that's fine. We are not going to desist there. We are going to keep on going with this episode with more words than you even know what to do with. The next word. Oh, uh, well, it's related to the next word. My sound effect is going to be... Can you hear that? Sort of. It's quiet. Um, it's a desk. I am sitting at a desk. I am at my the office where I do my day job 40-ish hours a week, and I'm sitting at a desk. And that's our next word, desk, if I didn't say it. D-E-S-K. Noun from the 14th century. 1A. A table, frame, or case with a sloping or horizontal surface, especially for writing and reading, and often, often, with drawers, compartments, and pigeonholes. What, 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 what are these pigeonholes? Maybe we need to find a picture of, I don't know, maybe an older desk with something called pigeonholes? 
It's a hole. It's got to be a hole of some kind. What do you put in there? I don't think you put pigeons in the holes. Do you put their head in the hole? I don't think so. But what are these holes? Why are they called these holes? What do you do with these holes? But more importantly, it's a desk. Lots of kinds of desks, as they said. It could be just, you know, there's just so many different shapes and styles from the last hundreds and hundreds of years for desks. There are ones, my grandparents, I think, had one where it had like a rolling th- cover thing. That was uh, that was sort of an old school desk thing. Um, yeah, there are some that are slanted, so maybe more for, for writing or drawing or something like that. And, uh, you know, these days, of course, we have fancy desks. We have ones that convert from sitting to standing. Sometimes they're electric, so you hold a button or something, and it moves up and down for you. Or maybe to move it up and down, you got to do one of those twisty things, like the handle that you go do with your hand. Though Those are, uh, they can convert sitting to standing. I'm trying to think of, I, there, then, of course, there's those desks that, like, CEOs have those big, big, wooden, mahogany, pointless desks. I don't know. As long as they got the drawers to put stuff, then then you're good. Maybe somebody should edit together many movie scenes or clips or photos of them of, of just lots of different kinds of desks. I would be interested to see that. That was 1A for desk. Here is 1B. A reading table or lectern from which a liturgical service is read. You go. I would think of that's a podium, but I guess they call it a desk. You stand up there doing doing the liturgy things, and you read the thing that you're supposed to read to the people. One C, a table, counter, stand, or booth at which a person works. So just really anything where somebody is working, doing some sort of work, uh, you could just call it a desk. You're working at your desk. Oh, do you have a nice big mahogany desk? No, it's a booth. I have a booth for a desk. Or a table or a counter or a stand. What is a booth desk? What is it? Will you work in a booth? A telephone booth? A voting booth? A diner booth? I want to work at a diner booth. I do love going to a, a cafe and seeing the people work there. And I have done that on occasion. Not usually. But I do I do have some work that I could do there. Just real simple. Just need a laptop. And it's like, that's my desk for the day. I'm just sitting here drinking drinking a coffee drink and eating a donut. 2A. A division of an organization specializing in a particular phase of activity. As in, the Russian desk in the Department of State. So, it's the division of a thing. So, is this the division of the Department of State? Is it in Russia? They specialize in a particular phase of activity. So, what is the Russian desk in the Department of State? Is that the part of the American Department of State? Which I don't think we have one that that named that. That seems... I don't know. But anyway, is it an, an American thing and they deal with the Russians? Or what? I don't... It's a thing. It's the desk of the thing that does the stuff that's all encompassed into a bigger thing. To be a seating position according to rank in an orchestra, as in a first desk violinist. I've heard first chair, second chair, third chair, fourth chair, fifth chair. How far does the chair go? Uh, but I don't think I've heard the word desk used for those. So that's a, that's a new one to me. I will now not be confused when I hear somebody say, I am third desk viola. This is from Middle English, desk with an E at the end, from Middle Latin, desca with a C, modified from Old English, desco, which means table, from Latin, discus, which means dis, no, dish or disc. And there's more at the word dish. So that's very interesting because the old Italian desco is table. That seems more connected to what we think of these days. I guess that does kind of make sense, though, because it's a little bit newer probably than just Latin. 
which is discus, which is a dish or a disc. So does that where that where table comes from? It be, it was started with a dish or a disc, and then it became a table, and then it's the desk that we think of. Hmm. Hmm. What kind of dish were, were the uh, were they using in the old Latin times in you know Rome or something? Was it a worky a workspace? I don't know. I just think that's kind of interesting. Desco. I am sitting at a desco, working on my work, with a cafe, in a cafe, both. The next word. It is desk bound. One word. Adjective from 1944. Restricted to work at a desk. Sorry, you can't get up from your desk. You have to work there. You can't work at any other place unless the desk is in a cafe. Uh, 1944. This is the end of World War II. Um, maybe that was a time when, you know, uh, there was a lot more uh, desk jobs, I guess. So then they said, oh, I'm desk bound. I can't get up and go go do my work other places. I got to sit at my desk all day. What was that movie? The Apartment. I think that might have been in the 50s or 60s. But yeah, there was just a a huge room of people at desks punching in numbers and doing things. And uh, yeah, we've seen that a lot in movies. Next word. D-skill. 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 Transitive verb from 1941. One. To reduce the level of skill needed for. Needed for what? A job. So, um, what are we? What are we reducing exactly? The your own skill to get a job, or so if somebody's looking to hire for a job, then they de-skill it. They say, okay, you don't actually need that much skill for this job, but you do need this lower level of skill for this job. That that's that's the one that make more makes more sense to me. Two, to reduce the level of skill needed for a job by. And then the example is a worker. So it is similar, but it's different. So to reduce the level of skill needed for a job or to reduce the level of skill needed for a job by a worker. There, but what, I'm trying to like grasp exactly what context each of these is used for to reduce the level of skill needed for a job. But then the word is for the worker... It's the same thing, right? It's the same. You're still... ah, Whatever. Let's tap on this desk and talk about a new word. Desk jockey. It's not disc jockey. It's desk jockey. Two words. Noun from 1980. A person whose job involves working at a desk. And maybe that desk jockey is desk bound. It would only make sense. I, f- I feel like this would have come from disc jockey, right? Is this a play on that word? It doesn't have any etymology. Uh, I am interested to see what uh, what the word jockey says when we get to that one. That's going to have a bunch of definitions, I suspect. You just you just you, it's your thing. You sit at a desk all day and do your stuff, so you can get paid to do stuff you prefer to do. Next word. It is deskman or deskman. Noun from 1913. A person who works at a desk. Specifically, a newspaper man who processes news and prepares copy. Basically, just anybody who works at a desk can be called a deskman, but I don't think there's any reason to put man are you going to say desk woman? Is that in here? It is not. Desk child, desk person, any one of those is fine. Or you can just say desk jockey. But then specifically a newspaper person who does all that stuff. So uh, I guess that's probably the first, the first time that they use this word desk man was for that job. But then it came. It became just, you know, anybody working at a desk is a desk man. And usually it was men at that time. But that clearly has changed. 
Next word. Desktop. First form. Noun from 1925. One. The top of a desk. What? That's not possible. The top of a desk. Also, an area or window on a computer screen in which icons are arranged in a manner analogous to objects on top of a desk. It's like a virtual desk, your screen, even though we almost never do things on the desktop of a computer anymore. It's just a place that we store all of our extra crap that we forget about. And then <laughs> then it's just a whole mess of icons and text. Um, so theoretically, the idea, I guess this is what it's saying, for the computer desktop was... You, you arrange things like you have them on your desk. So, well, the, there's a trash bin. You know, there's an icon for that. Um, but, you know, then, then there's your documents, I guess. Those are the, the main things. Your programs, I don't know, sometimes you have them there back more in the day. I don't know. There, there were many different iterations of how to use a desktop or where things are stored. Um, and uh, But there's no, there's no cup for your pens or your pencils your stapler, your your scissors, because you don't need them in that computer space. But yeah, I don't think really people, I don't think people think of that as arranging them like you would on your desk. But you do arrange things. Everybody has their own way that they like things. And uh, it's, it's just arranged in the way that your brain likes. Number two is just a desktop computer. But now this one's funny because... A desktop computer, in my mind, is a computer that you put on the top of a desk. But that would be a laptop. Because the desktop computer, there's one sitting next to me, it's not on top of the desk. Why We call it a desktop computer because it's maybe sitting next to a desk. But have they ever really sat on the desk? They must have at some point. You know, there have been different shapes and styles. Maybe smaller ones did. But, um, you know, the kind that we think of, these, like, towers, they uh, they usually sit on the side. So what was the first one that they were like, that? That is a computer to sit on the top of a desk. But it is funny how it's just, they just don't do that anymore, unless it's a laptop. And then you could put it on your lap. But how often do we do that? You're not supposed to do that because they get really, really hot. Sometimes we do, though. What is the picture on your desktop? Would you like to post a picture of that and tag me? I don't know why you would, but you can. Um, I have, let's see, I guess, I think, I think, um, yeah, maybe we'll just talk about it now. I have a whole folder of photos that I have taken over the years, and I sometimes add to it, although I haven't done photography for a while. Um, and they're just pictures that I like that are formatted wide opposed to vertical, and uh, this, then that just has them rotate. Like every minute, it'll rotate a new image. I don't usually get to see them because I'm usually I usually have programs open that are covering the desktop. But uh, it's just nice to see. Oh, there's I remember that time. I remember that thing. That's my story about the desktop picture. There's one picture that is not mine. I stole it. It's of the Milky Way, and I just wanted one of those. Next word. It is the second form of desktop adjective from 1958. Of a size that can be conveniently used on a desk or table, as in desktop computers. And here it does say compare to laptop, which also would be conveniently used on a desk or table. So I wonder if they mean compare or contrast to laptop. Hmm. But yes, desktop computers aren't typically put on the desks these days. Next word. Desktop publishing. Two words. Noun from 1984. The production of printed matter by means of a desktop computer having a layout program that integrates text and graphics. So I think the alternative of this would be just regular publishing where you're not using a computer you're using more analog, not digital ways of laying out and then printing. But then the computer came around 
and people were able to lay out printed things first on the computer, and then they could print them. So then they're like, well, how, how are we going to distinguish this type of publishing from the type of publishing we used to do? I know, we made it with a desktop computer, so let's call it desktop publishing. Hmm, clever, very clever. Couldn't be computer publishing, couldn't be something else. Next word. This is the prefix D-E-S-M or D-E-S-M-O. I guess it would be desm or desmo. It means bond or ligament, as in desmosome. Desmosome, which we are going to get to very soon. Uh, This is from the Greek desmos from dein, which means to bind. And there's more at the word diadem. So yeah, the... uh, the ligaments in your body, they're holding, they're binding all the things together. The muscles, the bones, the other things, they're, they're kind of holding it all together. So, yeah, that makes sense. Desm or desmo means binding and ligament. Anything that has to do with bonding together or ligaments is desmin them. Maybe this one. The next word. Desmid, D-E-S-M-I-D, noun from 1862. Any of numerous unicellular or colonial green algae. That's the end of that sentence. The order name is Zygnematales, especially the family Desmidiaceae. Ho, ho. It's I got it super close, just so close, you have no idea. But uh, yeah, so uh, unicellular, so single-celled or colonial green algae or algae is desmid or desmid. There's a picture. It, it looks like these are four different kinds of desmid. And I guess they're single cells. They are so differently shaped from each other. It's kind of astounding. There is one that looks like a boomerang, uh, kind of. It's uh, It's got a really kind of perfect arc to it. And then on the back side of the arc, so the arc goes around, it goes to a point on the left side, and then that point comes back towards the center. Um, but instead of the, the, uh, the shorter arc, the inside arc being a full arc, it actually, they, they come to a point uh, in the middle We'll have to post a picture of this desmid, desmid. Uh, And then there's a bunch of, like, dots in the middle that go kind of through the center of the thing. And those must be something in this this cellular thing. There's another one that I don't even know how to describe it. It's a circle, basically. Uh, The top and the bottom center portions, um, they... It's it, they kind of have the cross shape where it sort of flares out, but it's largely a circle. Yeah, I hope I can find some good pictures. And then, but the circle is filled in with a lot of things that look like forks. There's another one that it's kind of an oval shape with some spiky things on the ends on the outside. But there's two of these things, and they look connected to each other. Almost kind of looks like a um. Maybe a bumpy kiwi when you cut it in half because uh, there's some dots in the middle and then there's a darker spot kind of around the, the edge of it. And then there's the last one, which is there's three of them. I don't know if it comes in a set of three or uh, there's just three of them here. But uh, this one, if you if you take just each piece of it individually, um, there's it's sort of rectangular but the shorter sides, uh, they're made up of two bumps each. So it's like bump, bump, long line, bump, bump, long line, back to the other side. But there's all the, also these other things that are connecting them to the other. Again, we'll post a picture. It is very difficult to describe these things. I, w- I would like to hear what you have to say about those. The next word is desmosome. Noun from circa 1932, a specialized structure of the cell membrane, especially of an epithelial cell, 
that serves as a zone of adhesion to anchor contiguous cells together. And desmosomal is an adjective. So this was the example that we had in the desm or desmo prefix. And it's not about the ligament. It is about binding and a bond. So what does this one say? It's, uh, it's, it serves as a zone of adhesion. So yeah, that's connecting things, cell, contiguous cells together. It's a des, desmosome. Desmosome. Next word is our last word. That's the desktop. Desolate. Uh, or desolate. D-E-S-O-L-A-T-E. First form. Um, you're only going to get the first form in this episode. You're going to have to wait till the next episode to hear about the other form. This is an adjective from the 14th century. One, devoid of inhabitants and visitors. Synonym is deserted. It is desolate. There's just nobody around. It is a very sad sight. It's a ghost town. A very a desolate ghost town. Two, joyless, disconsolate, and sorrowful through or as if through separation from a loved one, as in a desolate widow. The widow is very sad because her her spouse died. Uh, she has no joy. She has dis... How do you say this word? Disconsolate? It's like you can't console them. Uh, and sorrowful. So it's... Uh, I wonder what the etymology will say. I'm I'm not looking at it because I don't want to skip ahead. But uh, yeah, she's she's desolate, I guess. Three A, showing the effects of abandonment and neglect. Synonym is dilapidated, as in a desolate old house. You know, three A and number one, they they're similar to me. They just feel like, you know, abandoned. Nobody there, nothing going on. So if I saw a desolate old house, I would just think devoid of inhabitants. But this one's more specific um, that has been neglected. So what what exactly is the difference here? I'm not sure, you know, dilapidated helps, but it's, it's just, it's, the first one is just lacking in people, and this one is, it's actually been abandoned and neglect. I don't know. There, it just doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of a difference between those two. Similarly, 3B, synonyms are barren and lifeless, as in a desolate landscape. Yeah, kind of feels like number one and three could maybe be combined. Hey, there's a 3C, devoid of warmth, comfort, or hope, as in Nope, synonym, gloomy, as in, desolate memories. Hmm, those don't sound like great memories. They don't have any warmth to them or comfort or hope. Maybe if your childhood was very sad and you didn't get a lot of love, you have desolate memories. Um, synonyms for all are the words alone and dismal. Desolately is an adverb, and desolateness is a noun. And I don't feel dismal or dilapidated or joyless, but I do this podcast often uh, in a desolate way because it's just I'm all alone and it is devoid of inhabitants except for myself. Nobody is inhabiting this podcast other than me except when I have a guest. I am actively working on scheduling some guests, which I have mentioned before. The etymology, from the Latin verb desolare, which means to abandon, from de plus solus, which means alone. And of course, our other English word like solo is from that. So yeah, it's just about uh, nothing, nothing there. It is all left and went away. Okay, I think it is time to reread the words so we can then come up with a word of the episode and sing a little song, which is going to be very, very bad and sad. We had desist, desk, 
desk bound, de-skill, desk jockey, desk man, desktop, desktop, desktop publishing, desmo, desm, desmid, desmosome, and desolate. I think I just have to pick desktop as the word of the uh, of the episode. I work on uh, desktop computers a lot, and I put files on my desktop, and I got pictures on my desk- desktop, and I don't think, I think most people, probably most people, don't really use these computers anymore. Um, I think a lot of people use their phones, their tablets, or their laptops for most things that they have to do. And unless you have to do some, like, serious uh, work on a computer... Um, like I do video work, so I use a desktop computer. You can use a laptop for a lot of that stuff, especially these days. But uh, yeah, desktop, I don't know. And then what's what's on top of your desk? A keyboard and a mouse and maybe some other fun things. Maybe some toys. That'd be a fun thing to put on your desk. Uh, I do have a couple of Funko things in boxes. I don't really know where else to put them. So they're sort of on the desk. Uh, desktop. Desktop top, desktop, 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 top, top, desktop, top. What's on your desktop? That's going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening to this show. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Real quick, let's say all the pluggy things. You can also go check the show notes for more information but basically we've got instagram and twitter at dictionary pod tag me in a thing follow me comment on things like the things do all those things please rate and review this show on apple podcasts give it the stars and talk about what you think of the show or maybe what you think about english words or other words and what which ones you like and all those fun things Google voice number, call it leave a message 917-727-5757 Ooh, merchandising, link is in the show notes. You can also find this on YouTube, at Speedjampar is my YouTube channel, and there's a bunch of other fun things on there. Well, I don't know if they're fun, but they're there. And uh, what else? Email, dictionarypod at gmail.com. You can email me if you want to say some stuff or anything. We can uh, swap podcast host spots. If you're a podcast host and we can swap guest things, we can do something like that. I don't know. Let's let's have fun. The first word in this episode is desolate. So we had desolate in the last episode. This is desolate. Second form, transitive verb from the 14th century to make desolate. How can you make desolate? Well, we have four sub-definitions. A, to deprive of inhabitants. How are you going to deprive of inhabitants? Are you going to kick them out? Are you going to murder them? Are you going to say, oh, look, there's a sale at the store over there, and then everybody leaves, and then it is desolate. B, to lay waste. Now, what exactly does that mean, to lay waste? Is that literally to kill every person? I don't know. To lay waste. Hmm. Hmm. What are the other contexts that you can use that phrase? C, the synonym is forsake. D, to make wretched. To make wretched. Desolator, E-R or O-R, that is a noun. And desolatingly is an adverb. So what would that be? Desolatingly, like you are... You are emptying a thing of inhabitants in a desolatingly way i don't know that's that i don't think that example worked very well but i'm sure you can use it in some way sound effect today shall be desolation is next noun from the 14th century one the act of desolating you're getting rid of the people the inhabitants of a place You're doing a desolation. Oh, let's go do a desolation. Let's go do a desolation. 2A. Synonyms are grief and sadness. Yeah, we had that uh, number two definition for desolate. Joyless 
disconsolate, disconsolate and sorrowful. To be for desolation, the synonym is loneliness, because there are no other inhabitants to make you not lonely. Three synonyms are devastation and ruin, as in a scene of utter desolation. It's just utter devastation, ruined. Everything has been destroyed. And maybe it looks like four... A barren wasteland. Beep, beep. The next word is desorb or desorb, S or Z sound. This is a transitive verb from 1924. To remove by the reverse of adsorption or absorption. Absorb, absorption. So that word, it has either a D or a B at the beginning. Adsorption or absorption. But this is the opposite of that. And the example of the thing that you might be removing is a sorbid substance. Sorbed or sorbid? Well, I've never heard of a substance described in that way before. But it, it makes sense because it's in the words adsorption or absorption or desorb. So a sorbid substance must be something that's liquidy? Ooh, I don't know. I can't wait to get to that word. I'm, I'm going to be so excited to get to the word sorbed or sorbid. So when you absorb a, a liquid, it's being, it's being put into like a rag. So the opposite of this would be what are you, when you squeeze out a towel of liquid, are you des desorbing the, the towel? Is that how you would use this word? I'm not sure. Please come up with a good example. Beep, beep, beep. The next word is desorption, noun from 1924, the process of disorbing. I feel like I have heard of this word before, but I don't know why it's just a very funny word to me. Because I don't, I don't hear it much, don't use it much, or ever. Next word, beep, 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 beep. Desoxy, and we saw this recently because this is just um, well, it's a prefix, and it's uh, the 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 synonym is deoxy, and uh, where did we have that? Not too far. I don't. Let's see here, 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 here. Well, here's deoxy, but I thought that didn't we come across one that said also desoxy? Oh, here, yes, yes. Deoxy is also disoxy. Uh, that's when, I guess, if you don't want to put two vowels, well, no, it, it is that case in here. Um, oh, but then didn't, was there the DES prefix? Maybe we saw it there? Let's find out. Let's give you all the information that you need. DES, here is that, and there is, oh, yes, yeah, it's um it's just it just means d unless um you got to put it between a couple of vowels and then uh, then then it's desoxy. That's where we saw it. That's the des prefix. So, what what is it? You're going to have to just go back to uh, deoxy to learn about desoxy. Next word. This this would have been great to have an expert on, but maybe we can still do that later. The sound effect Beep, 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 beep. Okay, that's as far as we're going to go with that part of things. Desoxyribonucleic acid. Desoxyribonucleic acid. Just making sure I read it right. Two words. Acid is the second word. The rest of it is the first word. Noun from 1931. The synonym is DNA. The D is desoxyribo. The N is is nucleic, and the A is acid. It's an acid. I don't think I ever really thought about that. Is it an acid? What is that? What? what, what? DNA. A fascinating thing. The next word, despair, first form, verb from the 14th century, starting with intransitive, which is to lose all hope or confidence. 
as in despair of winning. This this uh, example is not a full sentence. It's just what? How do you despair of winning? What does that mean? You lose all hope or confidence that you are going to win. Something like that. Uh, we have all been in a state of despair. I know I have. Feel like oh, I have no confidence in myself or hope that I am going to get better or that anything is going to be better. And uh, you know, it's it's just always right there on on the edge. I'm uh, sometimes on this side of that, sometimes on the other side of that. Luckily, I've been on the more positive side of that for a while, and I hope to continue. Transitive is obsolete, so you're not allowed to use this one, and it means to lose hope for. It does not give a specific example of how you might use it in this transitive form. Uh, I mean, it does make sense, lose hope for, um, but yeah, I guess... I guess just the way that English works mostly these days, we don't really use it that way, in the transitive way. Despairer is a noun. It is from the Latin desperare, which is de plus sperare, which means to hope. So when you put it the de, you you are losing hope. You There is no hope. Um, it is akin to... To so sperare is akin to the Latin spes, s p e s, which means hope, and there's more at the word speed. How? I mean, I see the connection with the letters of speed and spes, but hope, hope. How did how did speed come from hope? You hope to go faster. Uh, you have the need for speed, and you hope that it happens. Okay, let's read the next word. Despair, noun from the 14th century. One, utter loss of hope, as in a cry of despair. Also as in, gave up in despair. I have no more, no more hope for a thing, so all I have is despair. I'm not talking about me literally, I'm just talking about it as an example. Number two, a cause of hopelessness. As in, an incorrigible child is the despair of his parents. Ooh, a cause of hopelessness. So this child is the cause, is the reason the parents have no hope. Wow, that's a, that's a problem, child if I've ever heard of a problem child. Incorrigible. That is a great word. We will learn all about that in the eyes. Um, Yeah, that's just a depressing, despairing example. The next word. I'm trying to sing a little bit better better so you don't get so irritated by the sounds that are coming out of my mouth. Apologies for anything that's incredibly irritating. Despairing is the next word. Adjective from 1589, given to, arising from, or marked by despair. And then also, devoid of hope. Synonym is the word despondent. Despairingly is an adverb. So, yep, it's still just all about no hope for anything. Uh, If you have despair, you may also have depression which we talked about recently. Despair. I don't know. I don't I don't know if I have anything else to say about despair, which is good because that was the last one. So now we move on to be you boo boo boo. Despatch. D E S patch. This is the chiefly British variation of the word dispatch with D I S. And that's that's how they say that word, I guess. Why? If you are British, tell me why. Dispatch. I wonder if when we get to the word dispatch, will it actually mention this one? It might say the British the British say dispatch, but it might not give any reason why. The next word. Beep, boop, 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 boop. 
Desperado. That's the next word. You could also say desperado if you want. Noun from 1647. A bold or violent criminal is a desperado, especially a bandit of the western U.S. in the 19th century. And obviously, if you have never seen the movie Desperado, you should go see it. I think that is the first one that Robert Rodriguez made, uh, which ended up being a trilogy. Or no, was it... Whoa, was it... Was the first one the El... Was it not El Mariachi? Was that it? No. Oh, now I'm second-guessing everything that I have said. Yeah, I think Desperado might be the second one. Apologies for that. Anyway... Uh, they're good movies to watch. They're fun. And um, he completely self-funded the first movie um, by doing... He he stayed in a mental institution or some place where they were doing scientific experiments on him. And he used that time to write a script. And he also got paid. And I think that's how he funded his first movie. And yeah, I'm blanking on the name of it. I am going to have to look it up because my brain is not working. It's, um, it's L... L something with an M, and I don't think it's, it is El Mariachi, that's, that's what it is, yeah, it's a very cheap, but well done, uh, just really fun movie by Robert Rodriguez, 1992, that movie is 30 years old, oh, and then, if you're interested in the making of things like that, then you gotta read his book, uh, which, Ooh, it's a rebel without a crew. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, that's a good book. One of the very few books I've actually read. So Desperado is the sequel, and I believe that is, um, it's all about, yes, a bolder, violent criminal bandit in the Western U.S. I think maybe these took place in Mexico, if I remember correctly. So yeah. What, what is this from? It uh, doesn't really give much information. It says probably an alternative of the obsolete desperate which is a desperado, which is from the word desperate, but it doesn't say if it's English or Spanish. I would assume it's Spanish, but it doesn't say anything about that. Interesting. The next word, this is where this word came from. Sounds like the Smurfs song a little bit. Here's the word desperate. Adjective from the 15th century, 1A. Having lost hope. As in, a desperate spirit crying for relief. The spirit needs some help. It has lost hope. You have to help the spirit. I think we can already kind of see the connection to Desperado. Maybe the Desperado has lost all hope for life. Maybe they lost their family in a violent situation. And so they have. Be- maybe they're out for revenge. And uh, they were like, oh, God, I got nothing to live for. I'm just going to be bold and violent. 1B for desperate. Giving no ground for hope, as in, the outlook was desperate. It's a very sad outlook. 2A. Moved by despair, as in, victims made desperate by abuse. Uh, so that means that they were moved to so so by the so they were abused. The victims were abused, and because of that, then they had no hope. They were very sad and depressed, and so they have despair. They are desperate. To be involving or employing extreme measures in an attempt to escape defeat or frustration, as in made a desperate leap for the rope. I just saw a movie where somebody did that. I'm not going to say whether or not they caught it, but they did. Um, extreme measures. It, you're like, you you have no hope otherwise. If you don't make this leap, you, you have no hope. So your only form of hope is to make this leap to the rope. Three, suffering extreme need or anxiety, as in desperate for money. I please hope that you will give me money in the form of Patreon or merchandise. I am so desperate 
for you to join the Patreon and buy merchandise. <laughs> you know, it's true. I'm not, I have a job, but I sure would like to make money on this podcast. Four, involving extreme danger or possible disaster, as in a desperate situation. Five, of extreme intensity. Just anything that is has lots and lots of intensity. It's very extreme. It's desperate. Six synonyms are shocking and outrageous. Synonym for everything is despondent. Which, is that going to be in the next episode? Yes, the next episode. Despondent. Desperateness is a noun. And it's just from the Latin verb desperare, but it doesn't say what that means. Uh, but it's probably something about n- no hope. No, wait, 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 wait. Despair was also desperare, yes. So it's uh, getting rid of hope. Next word. Deep-y-do-beep. Desperately is an adverb from circa 1547. One, in a desperate manner. As in, struggling desperately. I'm, I'm struggling with my homework because I don't think I can do it and I am uh, have no hope that I will be able to figure it out. I have definitely been that kid at times. Number two, synonyms are extremely and terribly, as in desperately tired and desperately important. Hmm... It's, it's, I think we're ta- it's a little bit of a stretch. Just extremely or terribly tired, important. I don't know. We've taken desperate into another realm a little bit. Sort of. Not much. Maybe. I don't know. The next word. Desperation. Noun from the 14th century. One. Loss of hope and surrender to despair. Same stuff that we've been seeing, no more hope, and you're just like, I guess I'm just going to go into the world of despair in my desperation. Number two, a state of hopelessness leading to rashness. So yeah, that's the one I think we think of mostly with this one, is that you feel you have no hope, you have nothing nothing to lose, and you're like, well, I'm just going to go do a thing that's really crazy and rash, uh, just in the hopes that maybe... I will get what I need or get what I want. So if I were to connect that to this podcast, I would maybe I would maybe do something really rash to try and get people to join the Patreon or buy some merch or do subscribe to my YouTube, any of those things. What would that be? What would be really rash? Unnecessarily done. I don't know. I can't think of anything. This is why I haven't done anything. The next word. Beep, 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 beep. Despicable. De- well, you can you can emphasize the first syllable. Despicable. Despicable. That doesn't sound right to me. Adjective from 1553. Deserving to be despised. Also, so worthless or obnoxious as to rouse moral indignation. As in, despicable behavior. Also, I'm adding despicable blah, 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 despicable me. Uh, yes, I do think that Gru in those movies would be considered despicable because he's a he's he's a villain, you know, he's in the world of the villains, the guys who do the bad things, the people who do the bad things. And and they're all pretty despicable. They uh people despise them. Uh I don't know if they are, would be considered worthless, but they are obnoxious. And maybe don't things do they don't they don't do things in the the quote unquote moral way. A synonym is contemptible. Despicableness is a noun, and despicably is an adverb. De spiritualize is next, and you can you can uh, pronounce the those middle syllables in different ways despiritualize despiritualize different things transitive verb from 1840 to deprive of spiritual character or influence 
What exactly would you be despiritualizing? How do you do that? Um, yeah, I, I get sort of stuck on people. Like if I am a spiritual person, you can't despiritualize me because I have my own choice of how I want to be and live and think. Um, but maybe what if there's a thing that you can can you get rid of the spirit? I, I don't know. I don't know. But you are depriving it of its spiritual character or influence. So if something has in a spiritual influence over a thing and you're able to get rid of that somehow. Yeah, if I could give you a good example, that would have helped. But all of this was just utter nonsense that didn't help anybody at all. We have one more word for this episode. Despise. D-E-S-P-I-S-E. Transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to look down on with contempt or aversion. As in, despised the weak. Hmm. Sorry, I just can't agree with that. I can't agree with despising anybody. Look down on them with contempt or aversion. I mean, yes, if somebody is very mean and hateful and maybe injuring or murdering people, um, I'm I'm not going to be very happy with them. Um, Can I say despise them? Maybe. You know, I want to show love for all. So that's, that's a little hard, but uh, I think you can find the love in everybody. But yeah, sometimes people, people despise a lot of people and, or other things. What do I despise? Do I despise anything? I despise uh, bad drivers, mean drivers, uh, people who, don't, who aren't doing what I want them to do. No, that's a joke. Number two, to regard as negligible worthless, or distasteful. Negligible, worthless, or distasteful. It's despisable. That's, that's, uh, is that going to be in here? Is there a Z? No, it's not going to be in here. Despisement is a noun. Despiser is a noun. And definitely nobody should make a mint called a despisement because it's probably going to taste really bad and then you will despise it. This is from Latin despicere, despicere, which is from day, plus specere, which means to look. And there's more at the word spy. So how did that become despise? What happens when you put the D-E in front of to look? Mm, What is it, to not look? Oh, well, here it's to look down. The number one definition says to look down on with contempt or aversion. So, yeah, to look down at a thing. Basically, you feel like you're better, so you're looking down at them. There are some synonyms for the word despise. Despise. Contem, scorn, and disdain mean to regard as unworthy of one's notice or consideration despise may suggest an emotional response ranging from strong dislike to loathing as in despises cowards contem which is spelled c o n t e m n contem implies a vehement condemnation of a person or thing as low vile feeble or ignominious, 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 as in, contemns the image of women promoted by advertisers. Contemns the image of women promoted by advertisers. There's an image that advertisers will put out there of women, and we are contemning that, which means that we have, we we are condemning it, we don't like it, um, because, well, I can only guess that what they mean is that they're putting women in maybe uh, they're over-sexualizing them or putting them in a bad light or something. So many options. Usually it's the over-sexualization. That's what I'm assuming that they mean here. Scorn implies a ready or indignant contempt, as in, scorns the very thought of retirement. 
uh, implies a ready or indignant contempt. So it's like, I don't like the idea of retirement, um, maybe because I don't feel old yet, or I don't want to be old, or I just, I don't want to retire. I want to keep on working. I have always thought that uh, if I had a, a job that I actually, you know, was like my passion or something like that, like the thing that you wanted to do every day, it's like, you know, creating some sort of art or movies or music or whatever. Like if I was doing that for my for my job, uh, I would never want to retire as long as I can physically do that stuff. I also will, would have scorn for retirement. Disdain implies an arrogant or supercilious aversion to what is regarded as as unworthy, as in disdained popular music. The old people, when, when they get a little bit too old and they're not into the popular music anymore, they have disdain for it, and it sounds like poop. And South Park did a whole episode about that, which was hilarious. Uh, arrogant or supercilious? Yes, I think that's the big idea about this whole thing, is you're looking down, you're like, you, you think that you are better than this but you know what some people like the popular music are you better than those people i don't know that's up for discussion okay so we now have to reread the words and come up with a word of the episode we had desolate desolation desorb desorption desoxy desoxyribonucleic acid despair despair despairing despatch, desperado, desperate, desperately, desperation, despicable, despiritualize, and despise. There were many words in this episode. Who? well, hmm, I think I'm tempted to pick the DNA one, but I kind of feel like when we get to that episode, I might have to pick that for that episode. That's going to be a little while. I don't know what it says. Um, let's see. Desorb is a fun word. Despicable is a fun word. Can you be despicable but also liked? I don't know if that's possible. Let's just pick desorb as the word of the episode. I'm squeezing out a towel and it's getting desorbed. That's the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time... Oh, I thought I had something else to say. What was it? Despise? Was it? Which one was it? Disdain? Mm, I feel like I've lost it, but that's okay. It probably wasn't that important. Um, yeah, this has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Welcome to it. Um, that's that's a thing. Oh, I had a th- I had an idea. I don't know if it's a funny idea. Maybe someday if I feel crazy enough, I'll do a whole episode like an old school announcer. Uh, something like, uh, how, how, how would you do this? I didn't even prepare this like I don't prepare anything. Uh, yeah, this, the <laughs> this is not going to work out well. Something like, uh, the first form of this episode is the, uh, no, the first word in this episode is the first form of despite. Maybe that's a little too... Something. I don't know. Maybe someday. I think that might be kind of a fun. Oh, but to do it for a whole episode? Ooh, that might be too much. But yes, as that silly guy said, the first word in this episode is the first form of despite. D-E-S-P-I-T-E. Noun from the 13th century. Number one, the feeling or attitude of despising. We had despise at the end of the previous episode. The feeling of despising is despite. Synonym is contempt. Number two, the synonyms are, here, this is interesting, malice and spite. Despite and spite. Again, what the fuck is up with putting the D-E before a word and it meaning the same thing as the word? Can we can we change this please? Let's there's I've come across so many of these things. Spite and despite. 3A. An act showing contempt or defiance. It's about I just don't want to do a thing. I don't like the thing. I despise it, so I don't want to do it. 3B. Synonyms are detriment, 
and disadvantage. As in, I know of no government which stands to its obligations even in its own despite more solidly. That is a quote from Sir Winston Churchill. Uh, how how did he talk? That was there was that movie with um that guy and he played Winston Churchill and the makeup was amazing. I know of no government. No, that's more a Kennedy. <laughs> that's a whole different direction. I know of no government which stands to its obligations even in its own despite more solidly. That's what Winston Churchill, sir, said. And just the way that people used to talk, and of course British people speak and think differently than American people, and I am definitely on the lower educated side in America. My brain just doesn't do words so good. And uh, to, to, just to put words in that way that Sir Winston Churchill did is just, it just, uh, it hurts my brain a little bit, and it's very fascinating. I don't know, I don't know what it meant either. <laughs> there is a phrase, in despite of, which means in spite of. So you can say whatever that phrase means, which I guess we'll have to just get to when we get to the word spite. Uh, when we get there, uh, you can say that phrase either way, in despite of, in spite of. Okay, the etymology I think is the same as despise, which makes sense. So, we are now going to move on to boom, boom, boom. The second form of despite, transitive verb from the 14th century. One is archaic, to treat with contempt. Number two is obsolete. To provoke to anger, and the synonym is vex. So I guess you just can't really use despite as a verb anymore because it's either archaic or obsolete. You're treating something with contempt like you just don't like it. Oh, I despite. I'm going to despite that thing. I'm despiting that thing. Hmm. Bing, bong, bing. The third form of despite is a preposition from the 15th century, and here it means in spite of. So you don't even need to say in despite of, you can just say despite, as in played despite an injury, played despite an injury. So basically, and I figured we would come across this, come across this somewhere before we get to the word spite, which is just such a weird word. Uh, basically, this person, they played despite their injury, they had an injury, but even though they had the injury, in spite of the injury, they still played the game. So maybe it wasn't a terrible injury, uh, so that's what despite means. Now, how this is connected to contempt and malice and what, what were these other things? Contempt, scorn, disdain... How it's connected to that exactly, I guess I'm not totally sure. Like, mm, okay, maybe, maybe, because there's other examples too. Um, in spite of, despite, despite not liking this person, they still hung out with them. So despite is like, you don't like the thing that's going on, but you did it anyway. So I guess that's how you can connect these. What was the etymology of despise? It's from a look and then to look down. So you're looking down on the thing, but you're like, ah, eh, whatever. Let's do the thing anyway. I guess that's that. The next word is despiteful. Adjective from the 15th century. Expressing malice or hate. That's what this is all about. Looking down on a thing, don't like that thing, so I'm going to express it outwardly so you all can know I'm being despiteful towards it. Despitefully is an adverb. Despitefulness is a noun. The next word is despiteous. It's not despiteous, because that's not how English works. It is despiteous. D-E-S-P-I-T-E-O-U-S. 
adjective from the 14th century. And yes, no surprise, this is archaic, because have you ever heard this word? I didn't think so. Feeling or showing despite. The synonym is malicious. Despitiously is an adverb also archaic. Despitious. So what do we use instead? I guess malicious, we use that instead. Ooh, they, they did a thing in a malicious way. It was despitious. Hey, I can definitely hear some old school people saying this word. Boom, boom, boom. The next word is despoil. Spoil with a D-E. This is a transitive verb from the 14th century. To strip of belongings, possessions, or value. Synonym is pillage. Another synonym is is ravage. Why they needed to be separated, I'm not entirely sure about that. Uh, Despoiler is a noun. Despoilment is a noun. This is from the Latin despoliare, despoliare, which is from day, plus spoliare, which means to strip or rob. So... Again, I'm getting a little confused about this whole DE thing because despoil is to strip of belongings and it looks like spoliare is to strip. But maybe it also says there's more at the word spoil. So maybe spoliare means to spoil, but then despoliare means to strip or rob. It's just not very clear. I don't understand it. But it's all about taking away your things. Somebody comes in and takes away your things and they have despoiled you. You were spoiled by having all those things and they have despoiled you. I don't know. That's one way to think about it. Ding dong dong. The next word is despoliation. Despoliation. Noun from circa 1657 sounds very similar to what's that thing if you're exfoliation exfoliating your skin this is not that they just sound sort of similar despoliation the action or process of despoiling and the synonym is just spoliation without the de so again same meaning different words Displaying. So I guess if you if somebody's coming in to uh, take your stuff away, they are they're doing despoliation. You are being despoiled in a despoilage dis despoliation. The next word, boom boom boom, despond. First form, despond. Intransitive verb from 1655 to become despondent which we will learn all about very soon, very shortly and soon. This is from the Latin despondere, which is de plus spondere, which means to promise solemnly. There's more at the word spouse. Oh, interesting. So your spouse, you are promising solemnly to to be true to the spouse, to stay with them and support them and all those things that you say to them when you get married. And um, so I guess that would be spondere, would be to promise solemnly. But what is de spondere? Do you sense a pattern of my frustration? Let's see. The the book would probably need to be twice as long just to get in all of the information because I'm sure that they're just not putting things in here because they literally just don't have the space. They also had to make these pages super thin just to fit it all into this book that's like three inches wide or something. So that is despond. And I was thought that I had something else to say about that, but maybe not. So let's move on to the next word. The second form of despond, noun from 1678. The synonym is despondency. Despondency, which again, yes, we would. This the rest, almost the rest of this episode is all about despondent, despondent, despondencies things. That's what that is. The next word, 
the next word. Bow, bow, bow. Despondence. Noun from 1657. Again, the synonym is despondency. This is definitely one of those cases where I feel like... So the last word that we get to, the word despondent, you probably figured that out. It's, it's the last of this group, but it's the one that you need to know what these other ones mean more clearly. So you just have to, maybe after I read that one, you can just rewind and go back to these other words. The next word, despondency. This is the one that's the synonym for the previous two words, noun from 1653. The state of being despondent, synonyms are dejection and hopelessness. You definitely get an idea. Oh, I I feel hopeless. Didn't we have a word in the last episode or the one before that that was kind of similar? You know, despair. Yeah, I think that was it. Hopelessness. You feel dejected when you have despondency. You are so sad about the state of everything. Should we learn about what all of this means in more detail? Despondent. Adjective from circa 1699. Feeling or showing extreme discouragement, dejection, or depression. As in, despondent about his health. Well, if his health is not doing so great, maybe it's making him depressed, he feels discouraged or dejected, uh, then he is despondent about his health. I am not particularly despondent about my health. Overall, it's good, uh, maybe even great. But there are aspects like my back that I feel a bit despondent about my back because I just don't understand what's going on or what to do to fix it. And I've tried a lot of things and I think I might just need to get it removed. Despondently is an adverb. And everybody's favorite time, it's synonym time. It's synonym time, it's synonym time. Let's read the synonyms for despondent. Despondent, despairing. Oh, yes, see, right there, very similar. Desperate and hopeless mean having lost all or nearly all hope. That's very sad. Despondent implies a deep dejection arising from a conviction of the uselessness of further effort. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to do anymore. I don't feel like I can. It's not worth it. As in, despondent about yet another rejection. Ugh. I wrote a book. No, I didn't. That's just an example, a fake example. I wrote a book, and I tried to get it sold to all the places to, so they can make it and put it out there in the world, and they just keep on rejecting me, and I just feel like it's useless to keep on trying. I feel very despondent. Despairing suggests the slipping away of all hope and often despondency, as in, despairing appeals for the return of the kidnapped child. I mean, I guess when you're dealing with these words, you do have to give examples that are not the most happy things. Uh, so you, you, it, what is in this in this context? The child has been kidnapped. They're not coming back. They're not being returned, and you feel you are despairing because you've lost all hope and despondency. Uh, hopelessness. Yeah, it's all. That's all about hopelessness. Desperate. Desperate. Did we, 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 did we read that one? I think we did, yeah. That was in the last episode also. Interesting that these three words, despair, desperate, despondent, are so very close to each other. I haven't looked specifically at the etymology, but I do suspect that they are from a similar place. Desperate implies despair that prompts reckless action or violence in the face of defeat or frustration. Like... You just, you were so hopeless that you felt like, I have nothing to lose. I think we mentioned this in the previous one. Nothing to lose. I'm just going to go ahead and do anything I can. As in the example, one last desperate attempt to turn the tide of battle. Hopeless suggests despair and the cessation of effort or resistance 
and often implies acceptance or resignation, as in, the situation of the trapped miners is hopeless. Yeah, I think that uh, that final part implies acceptance or resignation. It just means like, we're hopeless about this thing and we just, we're done. Like, we can't do anything else. We have gone through all these stages. We were despondent and then we ha- we were despairing and then we were desperate. We made one final attempt, but then it didn't work and so we were hopeless. There's no hope left to to save the trapped miners. On that note, uh, real quick, the etymology... Well, maybe we can do a look. This is from the Latin despondens, or despondere. And what is desperate? Desperate is mm, different. Desperare. And despair is desperare. So they're all a little bit different. So is there a different Latin word that these all stemmed from that starts with D-E-S-P? Hmm. If you know, please let me know, because I would find that fascinating. The next word is despot or despot. D-E-S-P-O-T. Despot, despot. Noun from 1585. 1A, a Byzantine emperor or prince. Very specifically, they have to be Byzantine. That's probably where this word was started, I would assume. 1b. A bishop or patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church. So, I don't think that's Byzantine, but maybe they are connected. I really don't know my religious things, especially in that part of the world in that time period. But uh, a bishop or a patriarch of that Eastern Orthodox Church is a despot. C. 1c. An Italian hereditary prince or military leader occurring, no, I don't know why I said that, during the Renaissance. So we had Byzantine, we had Eastern Orthodox Church, and now we have Italian. 2a, a ruler with absolute power and authority. That's the one that I definitely am aware of with this word. They just, they, you can't, they, they control everything. You can't control them. They have Total control over their country, their region, whatever. And uh, they probably are not doing always the nicest things. I think that's part of the meaning behind this word, despot. Like this one, to be a person exercising power tyrannically. They're a, a, they are a Tyrannosaurus Rex. They are a, it's tyranny, tyrannically. There's another word related to that one. But it's not good. It's not good. They're exercising all of their absolute power in a tyrannical way. The etymology says this is from the Greek despotes, despotes, which means master or lord or autocrat, which is from the des prefix, which is akin to the uh, domos word, which means house. So the des is kind of like house. And then potes, which is akin to the word posis, which means husband. So what is that? Hus- house husband? Is that what we're trying to say here? The Greek word despotes means house husband? Um, akin to the Sanskrit dampati, which is lord of the house. So yeah, that's it's not house husband like we think of today. There's housewife and house husband, house whoever, the one who typically stays at the house. That's not what this is. The husband Back in those days, especially, they were considered the Lord, the man of the house. You know, that phrase. And so, uh, this that's the Lord of the house, the one... And it's so it's probably started with the one being in the house, but then it expanded to a region, a country, something bigger. They became the Lord of the house of all of the stuff. Yeah... There is more at the words dome and potent. Hmm. So dome comes from the domos, which means house. And then potent comes from posis, which means husband. So that's that's kind of an interesting word to connect to husband, male, that thing. Not surprising from a patriarchal context. 
I think that's enough for despot, except that we have another similar word in this episode. Despotic. D-E-S-P-O-T-I-C. Adjective from 1604. Of, relating to, or characteristic of a despot. And despotically is an adverb. And we will have one more related word in tomorrow's episode. Ooh, my stomach is growling because it's early and I haven't had breakfast yet. So, where do we go from here? Where do we go? I'll tell you where we go. We go to read the words again. Despite, 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 despiteful, despiteous, despoil, despoliation, despond, despond, despondence, despondency, despondent, despot, and despotic. Wow, we have had a couple of episodes that are just sad, sad, sad words. What did we have? I'm just going to go back. We had desolate, despair, and of course there's other forms of these words that are related. Desolate, despair, uh, desperate, despicable, despise, despite, sort of, despoil, uh, despond, despondent, despot. I mean, this is just a very, uh, you know, it's just negative. Not, it's not always negative. That's not totally what I mean. But I think, you know, you look at these definitions, it's a lot of hopelessness and other things like that. All right. So which one of these very sad words are we going to pick as the word of the episode? Um, I guess I would want to pick one that's not quite so negative. But I don't know if any of them were. It provoke anger, malice, malicious. I mean, despitious is a fun word to say, but it does mean the malicious, which I'm not a big fan of at all. Same with despoil, stripping, pillaging, ravaging. Um, I guess despite might be one of the the least bad words. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess we'll pick despite, maybe the preposition specifically, because I guess, yeah, I don't know, fine, despite, I'm doing this podcast despite everybody saying it's dumb, that's the song for despite, this has been Spencer dispensing information, goodbye. Hello, word nerds, how are you doing today? This is the podcast called The Dictionary, and I am Spencer, and I am reading this book in short sections, and then I talk about the things that I read, and I try to explain them for myself and for you and for all the other people out there and all the other the pets and the animals and the things who are listening to this. Uh, that's how the show goes. There are sound effects to designate when a word ends and another word starts, and there are sometimes songs and silly things and guests... And go check the show notes for more information. The first word in this episode is despotism. D-E-S-P-O-T-I-S-M. One, two, three. Noun from circa 1727. 1A. Rule by a despot. Despot, despot. Either one is fine. So the rule, what is this? It doesn't say ruled by. It's not the people who are ruled by. It is a rule that a despot creates. Rule by, no, this is just, um, if a place is ruled, it, that whole thing is called the rule. It's kind of a weird English thing, isn't it? Rule by a despot. I don't know of a better way to explain that. 1B, despotic exercise of power. So when and there's a exercise of power, if somebody is using their power in a tyrannical way with lots of authority, that would be despotic, and that whole thing is called despotism. 2a. A system of government in which the ruler has unlimited power. Synonym is absolutism. The despotism is run by a despot. Yeah, this is... I, I just... I... I ah, blah, 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 blah. I realize that this happens a lot. There are lots of countries that have, you could call them a despot, you could call them all those other words that we have that are similar. But uh, but yeah, it's kind of crazy that something like that happens. And then they can just rule the country in whatever way they want. 
To be a despotic state. So that could be like a state, a region, a country, uh, and it is ruled by a despot in with unlimited power. That is it for all the despot words. I, n- I never know. Despot, des- despot, despot. Spit over there, you despot. The next word. Ooh, what's my, my sound effect is going to be... Uh, Mm, mm, mm. The next word is desquamate. D E S Q U A M A T E. Intransitive verb from 1828. To peel off in scales. To peel off in scales? Desquamation is a noun. What are, are you taking? A fish, a lizard, a thing that has scales, and are you peeling them off scale by scale? I don't like the sound of this at all. Maybe it is. Do you desquamate a fish when you catch it and you cook it? I have never done that. I never will do that. But I guess maybe that's what it is. To peel off in scales. Or maybe it's an orange. Maybe you can cut the orange peel into scales and then you can peel it all off. This is from the Latin verb desquamare, which means to scale, which is from de plus squama, which means scale. The squamas, the scales are the squamas, and to scale is desquamare. Yeah, I got, that must mean to just take off the scales of a living thing. Mm-mm-mm. The next word is dessert. D-E-S-S-E-R-T, which is really one of the best words in the whole world. Noun from 1600. One, a usually sweet course or dish, as of pastry or ice cream, usually served at the end of a meal. Although I do think it makes much more sense to serve it at the beginning of the meal, because in case you die during your meal, you will at least have gotten dessert if you're into that sort of thing. A dish, a course. A course, I mean, that's kind of the same thing. You know, a a meal can be in five courses. You get uh, an appetizery thing, a salad thing, and soup thing, an entree thing, and then a dessert thing. Um, Or it's just a dish. Like, if your meal is not made up of courses, then the dessert is just a dish. It says pastry or ice cream. Yes, that covers a lot of ground, but there are so many other types of desserts. Number two is British. A fresh fruit served after a sweet course. What? So if they're eating a lot of courses in a meal, then after the sweet course, there is a dessert course, which is fresh fruit. Now, what do they call the sweet course? Does that have a whole different name? Gotta talk to my Brit people. My British, my Brits, what you up to? Tell me what you call this sweet course. Is it dessert? Is it another thing? Is this more of an old school way of talking about this thing? Oh, the etymology. This is from Middle French. Desservir. I'm I'm so good at speaking French. Desservir. And that means to clear the table. What? Did you know this? I didn't know this. That is from de plus servir, which means to serve. So when you serve, you bring everything out, but then you put in the de or the des in front of it, and you're clearing the table. And so what? Does this mean that when you get the dessert, you have cleared everything else except for the dessert, or the table gets cleared when you get the dessert? I think I think back in the day, if we're looking at more of this old school way, of thinking they probably cleared everything then you then they brought the dessert but then they still had to clear that so it's uh, i don't know if that works but that's that's sort of my idea of that oh dessert how are you doing the next word Mm-mm-mm. dessert spoon one word noun from 1754 a whole 154 years after dessert. So they had to eat dessert with their hands before the dessert spoon was invented. Number one, 
a spoon intermediate in size between a teaspoon and a tablespoon for use in eating dessert. And if you are at a place that has courses or particularly fancy, they're, hmm, now I don't know if they would put the dessert spoon out with all of the other utensils. You know, you got seven forks on one side and three knives on the other side and then spoons up above or something. But I don't know if they give you this the spoon at the beginning. I just don't remember. Either way, it's between a teaspoon and a tablespoon. It's a medium-sized spoon. Number two, the synonym is dessert spoonful. Dessert spoonful and dessert spoon. And that actually is our next word. So let's say some sounds. Mm-mm-mm. Dessert spoonful. Noun from 1839. One, as much as a dessert spoon will hold. It is a dessert spoonful, which is a mouthful to say. Number two is chiefly British. A unit of measure equal to about two and a half fluid drams. Two and a half fluid drams. Well, I may have to do some conversions with my good old friend Google and put that in the show notes so you can see what two and a half fluid drams converts to. I would assume it is somewhere between a teaspoon and a tablespoon just based on the other definitions, but I'm I'm not entirely sure. It could be something different. We will find out. What is it in ounces? What is it in teaspoons or tablespoons? Uh, What are the other liquid volume measurements that we use. Mm, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. We'll find out. Dessert spoonful. The next word. Mm, 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 mm. Dessert wine. Two words. Noun from 1773. A usually sweet wine typically served with a dessert or afterward. I just had one of these, although I guess technically it was an ice wine but I think you can still consider that a dessert wine. Although I do think that dessert wines typically would be like a port or something like that, uh, that you get. But ice wines are, well, let me backtrack. Ports are usually much stronger in alcohol than like a regular wine. So you usually pour a lot less, maybe like one ounce or two ounces. You just sip it. You have a little bit at a time. You don't take it like a shot. That is not, that is not cultured. Uh, ice wines also, I think, tend to be higher alcohol and you pour a little less. The bottles are smaller. But uh, but yes, either way, it's a wine that is sweet and you have it with dessert or after. So that's like a second dessert. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I have any of this at home right now. I usually have at least one bottle. But yeah, got to get some. Got to get me some dessert wine. Going to get me some dessert wine. Let's have some dessert wine. I'm going to drink the whole bottle in one sitting. No, I'm not. The next word is... Mm-mm-mm. Destabilize. Transitive verb from 1924. One. To make unstable. You're taking the stabilization away from a thing so it is not stable anymore. What could we be talking about? Well... I do a lot of camera stuff, so that's the first thing I think of. Although usually with camera things, you want to stabilize it because maybe you shot it handheld. So that's the opposite of this. But also, number two, to cause, as a government, to be incapable of functioning or surviving. You're making the government unstable. How do you do this? You take out people... You, 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 I don't know, I don't know, lots of things, I guess, that you can do. But whatever it is, uh, you putting in people who maybe aren't going to do a good job, I don't know. The government is not going to be capable of functioning or surviving, so you are destabilizing it. Destabilization is a noun. Next word. Mm-mm-mm. Destain. Transitive verb from 1927. To selectively remove stain from, and the example, what what are you removing it from? It is a specimen for microscopic study. So, now I do know that when they're making the slides for a microscope, there's the glass slide, and then they put the specimen on the thing, 
and then they put that drop of something. Now, is it a stain? I think it might be a, some sort of stain. So things pop better. They can, they're more visually seeable. Uh, and then I think they put a little glass piece on top of that so it's all squished in that one little spot. But how do you and why do you de-stain? You're selectively removing the stain from the specimen. So I don't know, maybe we got to put in the in the show notes a link to talk a little bit more about this because I'm curious now about uh, de-staining a microscopic specimen. Mm-mm-mm. The next word is de-Stalinization or de-Stalinization. So it's D-E hyphen, and then there's a capital S, Stalinization. Noun from 1951, the discrediting of Stalin and his policies. Stalin was a leader in Europe and had a whole bunch of policies, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people did not like him or what he had to say. And so that's why there was this whole thing of discrediting him and getting rid of his ideas and just, you know, just de stalinization stalinizationing de de-Stalinizing it all. Next word. Mm-mm-mm. De-stigmatize, transitive verb from 1973, to remove associations of shame or disc- disgrace from, as in, de-stigmatize mental illness. And I very much like this idea, personally. This is my podcast, so I get to say what I believe personally about things, which, you know, they're clearly correct. Uh, but yes, There is still a lot of shame and disgrace and embarrassment and all those other similar words around mental illness specifically. That is a really, really big topic. And, uh, you know, we talked about this in the depression episode recently, and uh, we were getting better at de... My mouth doesn't want to say this word. We're getting better at destigmatizing it, but we still have a lot of work to do. So if you have some some stigma, some shame, disgrace, embarrassment around mental illness or something else like that, uh, maybe see what you can do to de-stigmatize it in your brain so uh, you can just feel better about it because you should feel better about everything about yourself. Um, Trying to think, what are are some other examples of things that can be de-stigmatized? Just just anything that other people people or groups of people may look down upon or or uh, but it's more about the shame or disgrace so it's more about your personal feelings but those personal feelings are based on kind of what culture and society say so yeah yeah we're getting better we're getting better but we still who i know i've said that a lot but there's still a lot a lot a lot of people who still look down on things, you know, from issues of of gender and race and mental illness and and lots of more topics. The next word. Mm -mm -mm. Distyle or distale. This is D-E. That's the first word. Second word is S-T-I-J-L. Distyle. Noun from 1917, a school of art founded in Holland in 1917, typically using rectangular forms and the primary colors plus black and white and asymmetrical balance. This is from the Dutch phrase de style with a capital D, which literally means the style or the style. Um, and it says that a magazine published by members of the school. So there was the school. This is the school of art that was founded in Holland in 1917. And then they made a magazine, I guess, and they called it De Style. And, uh, and then that the, the art form became, became named De Style, which is kind of funny because it's very similar to The Style, just with that sort of 
loose way to say the word the. It's the style. You know, it's the style that everybody loves. It's that that style? No, it's the style. I think I know which one this is, um, but I will post a picture on social media so I can confirm my suspicions, and then you can also see what the style of art this is. The next word. Mm-mm-mm. Destination. Noun from the 14th century. One. The purpose for which something is destined. The purpose. So if you are destined to go on a trip to Africa, then that is your destination. Maybe that's not the best example because, you know, we'll, we'll talk about uh, your, your, the destiny. We'll talk about that later. Um, number two, an act of appointing, setting aside for a purpose or predetermining. So the act of appointing. So you're basically, you're creating, you're doing some things now to create a future which is the destination, uh, you're pointing or you're setting something aside for a purpose, you're doing some predetermination, um, and so that that act of doing that thing is predestination because you are creating the destiny for that thing. And yeah, the destiny will be the last word in this episode. Number three, a place to which one is journeying or to which something is sent, as in kept their destination secret. They didn't want anybody to know where they were going. Maybe it was a secret honeymoon, just a secret trip. Uh, Yeah, so you plan a trip. That's your destination. Where are you going to go? That's your destination. Is life about the destination? No, it's about the journey. It's about how you get to the destination, what you do to get there, all of the things that happen. It's like you're on the yellow brick road. That was the the whole thing about meeting the people and the experiences and making friends and having a good time. That's what it is. But it's a little bit about the destination too. Four, a place worthy of travel or an extended visit. And this is often used attributively as in a destination restaurant or a destination resort. So you have to go. It's it's so good. The resort, the restaurant is so good. You have to go to a place. You have to travel probably a good distance to get there. Some really rich people will just get in their private jet and have a destination restaurant. They'll go to Paris for a, for a, a dinner and then come back. I don't think this is a great idea. It's a really big waste of resources with the plane and everything and the gas and all that. Uh, I'm sure there's just fine restaurants near where you are. Resort, obviously. Most of us don't live by a resort, so you have to travel to a resort. I think the most that I would travel to go to a restaurant would be, hmm, probably an hour. I think even that is pushing it. To Just to go to one restaurant? I mean, if, it, if I was going to meet some friends at that restaurant and they live close by, I think that makes a lot more sense. That's when an hour is a lot easier for my brain to handle. But uh, but yeah, more 30, 45 minutes is much more reasonable just to go to a restaurant. Even that might be pushing it. You know what? My ideal is like five minutes. I don't like, I just want to stay close to home. The next word. Mm-mm-mm. Destin. I guess that's how you pronounce it. Destin. There is an E at the end. It is a transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to decree beforehand, and the synonym is predetermine. So if you are saying something before it happens, uh, that is destin. This one, this word I'm not so familiar with, and hmm, yeah, but I get the concept. Number two, A, to designate, assign, or dedicate in advance. As in, the younger son was destined, see, this is the context I know, was destined for the priesthood. He was designated, assigned, dedicated to it. They knew that he was going to do it. They, he showed signs maybe when he was younger. Also as in, a trait that destines them to failure. 
What sort of trait might that be? I don't think I've ever seen this word just... I mean, maybe I have, and I just can't think of it, but usually I feel like we see it in the past tense, destined... Destinine. I don't know if I've seen that version. Destines, a trait that destines them, maybe... But yeah, destin with the E. For some reason, I just feel like maybe I just don't use the word like that. So I haven't seen it. At least that I'm aware of. To be. To direct, devise, or set apart for a specific purpose or place. As in, freight destined for European ports. The European ports are the destination... Um, And so this is all kind of similar to the number two definition for destination. That one is a noun, though. So that's the act of creating what something is destined for uh, or creating the destin, the des, the destin. I guess it would be the no, but this is a verb. So, yeah, destin is a verb. Uh, It's an active thing that's happening. This podcast is destined to be very long. It's going to take a very long time to create this podcast. Other than that, I can't say what it is destined for. I can only guess. At the rate of how everything is going, it is destined to never be in the charts and just be a thing that uh, that I do for myself. Okay, that was it for Destin. The etymology is not terribly interesting. This is similar to something I feel like we just saw in the last few episodes. Um, It is from the Latin destinare, which is from de, plus stinare, which is from Latin stare, which means to stand. And I do think we saw that recently. I don't think I'm going to be able to find it, but it was I was a little confused about why is this to stand? You're stopping a thing Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. That's okay. That's okay. But yes, um, I guess in this context, to stand, you, you, you're you walking, you're walking to your destiny, to your destination, and then you stop and you stand and you are there. Okay. The next word. Mm-mm-mm. Destiny. D-E-S-T-I-N-Y. Destiny's child? Noun from the 14th century. One. Something to which a person or thing is destined. The synonym is fortune. As in, wants to control his own destiny. Well, he does. Whether he knows it or not, he does. There are times in your life when somebody might be making decisions for you, or it seems like they are. Um, but, you know, when it all comes down to it, you ha- you do have control of your own destiny. You are making decisions both in your, your physical life, where, where you do, what you do, who you see, all those things, uh, but also your, your mental state. You control how you feel about a certain situation to a, to a degree. Uh, you can work on it if you don't like the way that your brain is thinking about things. I think that you can, to a to a degree, control that. Um, yeah, so you you can control your destiny. Whatever you want, what you want in the future, make decisions now to go on that route. Two, a predetermined course of events often held to be an irresistible power or agency. The synonym is the word fate. And this is a topic that I think about pretty much on a daily basis. Do we have fate? You know, a lot of people think about this all the time. Is there fate? Is everything predetermined? Do we have a destiny? Or do we? are we creating it as we go? Do we have control over everything? And uh, yeah, you know, the number one and number two are a little bit different. Uh, in, in terms of the example, you want to control your own destiny? Can you do that, or is it predetermined? We'll never know. Well, we might know, but maybe we won't know. I don't know. I think there's scientific evidence, maybe for both. It's a very complicated thing. So, either way, choose which one you like and go with that. 
and live your life that way. And be happy. This is going to be hard to pick a word of the episode. We had today despotism, desquamate, not going to pick either one of those, dessert, might pick that, dessert spoon, dessert spoonful, I like it, but I'm not going to pick them, dessert wine, contender, may not pick it though, I like a, I like a dessert wine though, destabilize, maybe not, destain, probably not, destalinization, while I think it was probably good to do that, don't know enough about that, not going to pick it. Destigmatized, also a very good one. Destyle, uh, probably not going to pick that, but I, you know, it's art, so that's a good thing. Destination, destin, and destiny. Ooh, this is so difficult. I may, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you know, the the top choices are dessert, destigmatize, and probably destiny. Mm, mm, mm. My destiny later tonight is definitely going to be dessert, and I have de I have no stigmatization. I have that I have destigmatized that for sure. Oh, I don't know. Maybe should I? I mean, okay, those are the runner-ups. I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do because they're all very important. Um, I mean, normally I would probably pick dessert, but I just find destiny. Why did these have to be in the same episode? How, why did that have to happen? Um, ooh, all right. I may have to uh, pick later. I don't know if I can pick now. What? Should I flip a coin? I don't have a coin. There's no coins here. Uh, 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 destiny, destiny and dessert. Are there other good dessert words that we'll pick later? There are. I mean, there's always good dessert words. I mean, we haven't even gotten to donut yet. That's a good one. Destiny, I don't... I mean, there is fate. There is fate. Predetermined. Oh. Should we just pick something completely different? This is just a waste of time for everybody. Let's pick dessert as the word of the episode. Dessert. Dessert. Don't go dessert in me. I want the dessert in my life. Dessert. Come over here. Be my destiny later tonight. Oh, yeah. Dessert. Mm -mm -mm. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary. Wow. Yay. This is so exciting. So exciting to have you here. Wonderful, wonderful, beautiful, smart, intelligent, amazing, clever, and funny people. Hey, we are going to talk about some words. I don't know. Just, you know, sometimes we have sections of words that are, you know, there's something. I don't know what they're going to be. We'll see if we have anything to say about them. We'll try. We'll try to make this interesting and fun and educational. But we'll, let's see what happens. The first word is destitute or destitute. D E S T I T U T E. Adjective from the 14th century. One, lacking something needed or desirable, as in a lake destitute of fishes. The lake desperately needs and desires these fishes. The fishes, they help to get the life going and there's there's life cycles and you know there's probably plants and the plants help the fish and the fish fish help the plants and just the the ecology of the lake is just so much more interesting and fun when you got the fish in there otherwise if there's no fish it just feels very dead number 2 lacking possessions and resources especially suffering extreme poverty as in, a destitute old man. No resources, no possessions, or just in general, just being in extreme poverty. There are places in major cities around the country, and uh, obviously around the world too, that um, just, it's, what are, what are they called? Uh, I don't know, homeless camps? Tent camps, tent camps, I think that might be it. Where people are just living because they don't have a home and they are, they're living in extreme poverty, whether by choice or not by choice. It 
doesn't really matter. This They are living in a, a life of destitute. Destituteness is a noun. And especially for the people who did not choose that kind of life, um, it's, it's very sad. I don't know what to say about that. I felt like I was going on a path and then I lost it. Uh, yeah, no possessions, no resources. Um, and I think we need more more shelters, more probably government money to to help these people in any way. I know that there are some cities who are doing things to help, and uh, I don't know what the exact uh, where that where if they worked or not. Um, you know, there's like tiny home communities, I think. But um, whatever we can do to help get people out of a destitute situation, I think is good. Like this next word. That's the clicky sound effect. Destitution. Noun from the 15th century. The state of being destitute, especially such extreme want as threatens life unless relieved. That is an amazing way to word that. Um, I feel like maybe the word want is... I mean, it's probably technically correct, um, but I guess if your life is threatened by something you want, that doesn't really make sense to me. It feels like your life might be threatened if you don't have something you need, like food and probably shelter. Uh, so unless the unless this bad thing is relieved, your life might be threatened. Unless you get food or shelter, water, whatever, you will may not have a life anymore. You will not, may not, you may not have a life anymore. Uh, that is destitution. This synonym is the word poverty. I think we have talked about that enough. I think we need to de-stress. Uh, two words with a hyphen. Intransitive verb from 1979. To release bodily or mental tension. And the synonym is unwind. Oh, yes, this is a good word. I, unless I make a very specific point to do this, I, uh, I'm i not really great at de-stressing. Uh, my body and brain are just kind of going, going, going a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, eating dinner, we're watching TV or movies. Uh, so that's a de-stress time. But I think we all need at least one other time in the day to de-stress, not just at the end of the day. Um, so like meditation, once or twice a day, do some meditation, sit quietly, 10 to 20 to 30 minutes, that, that will help a lot. Everybody's got their own ways of de-stressing, lots and lots of ways. Um, yeah, I just, sometimes I feel like if I'm going, my, my just, I feel, I feel tight, uh, I feel like I'm not breathing, I have to force myself to breathe sometimes, remind myself, slow down and breathe and de-stress. The next word. Destriere. Destriere. And the other way is destrier. Destrier. It is spelled D-E-S-T-R-I-E-R. Destrier. That's the, the first pronunciation has the emphasis on the first syllable. Destrier. I feel like that might be the better better way to say it, possibly. Noun from the 14th century. This is archaic, and the synonym is war horse. Also, a charger used especially in medieval tournaments. So a charger, I guess, uh, maybe like in jousting, they're charging towards the other person, and maybe they're sitting on a war horse, which is the thing that is doing the charging, I can only guess it's a destrier. This is from Anglo-French. Destrier, destrier, destra, which means right hand. Interesting. From the Latin dextra, which is the feminine of dexter, which also does mean right or right-sided, right hand, something like that. So, okay, so... Why exactly is the war horse like your your right hand man? Are you holding it with your right hand, uh, or your? I don't know. I don't know why it's why it's all about the right side. 
but uh, that that is interesting. But it is archaic, so I guess we don't use it anymore. We just use warhorse, and we have to wait a very long time until we get to that word. The next word, destroy. Verb from the 13th century, and we are going to see a lot of similar words through most of the rest of this episode. Um, We are starting with transitive one. To ruin the structure, organic existence, or condition of. As in, destroyed the files. I think, if I remember correctly... Trump, he took all those files, and I think he wanted them, like, declassified or something, and maybe he wanted to destroy some. I don't know exactly, but yeah, it's, uh, people in power did a thing bad. They often want to destroy the files. Also, to ruin as if by tearing to shreds, as if by tearing to shreds, as in, their reputation was destroyed. Their reputation was metaphorically torn to shreds as if somebody had put their reputation into a paper shredder and then you give it to the pet shop so their puppies and kittens can pee on their reputation. 2A. To put out of existence. The synonym is the word kill, as in destroy an injured horse. I do not like it when the word destroy is used in a context like this. If you got to kill the horse because it's injured, I understand that. Sometimes, I mean, I don't, you know, if it's a racehorse, maybe they're not going to race again, but I don't think you need to kill them or destroy them. When you put destroy there, it feels like you are quartering them. You're pulling them limb from limb. You're blowing them up. You're doing something way more extreme than just killing them instantly with a gunshot to the head. Destroy. I don't like it when destroy is used there. That's just my own personal feeling. To be. The synonym is neutralize, as in, the moon destroys the light of the stars. Hmm. It neutralizes because when you got a moon out in the sky, especially if it's a full moon, so it's being completely lit up, Uh, the face that we see is being completely lit up by the sun on the other side of the planet, Um, then um, it's creating a lot of ambient light in the sky at nighttime, and so it's a lot more difficult to see the lights from the stars. So they're being neutralized and destroyed. The stars are not being destroyed, just the light from the stars, to our viewpoint, is being destroyed. To see. Synonyms are annihilate and vanquish, as in armies had been crippled but not destroyed. And that is in a quote from W.L. Shearer. Annihilation, vanquished, yeah, I, I destroy makes sense there to me for sure. Intransitive is to cause destruction. This is from the Latin destruere, which is de plus struere, which means to build. So you put the de in front, and it is the opposite of build. It is destroy a thing. And there is more at the word structure. So struere led to the word structure, because a structure has been built. That, that all tracks. The next word is destroyer, noun from the 14th century, one, one that destroys. Was there a was there a comic book character or something named Destroyer? I feel like there would be. It was never big in the comic books, but I feel like there's got to be something named Destroyer somewhere. Two, a small, fast warship used especially to support larger vessels and usually armed with guns, depth charges, torpedoes, and often guided missiles. So it's a real big boat that can shoot things and also might uh, have larger larger vessels on it or support larger vessels. So th- there are larger vessels out there and maybe they don't have as much uh, guns and things. So this, the destroyer comes in and destroys the enemy. 
Because, yeah, it's small and fast. The next word. I was trying to do like a clicky a clicky thing. I don't know. The, the next word is destroyer escort. Two words. Noun from 1924. A warship similar to but smaller than a destroyer. So we have large vessels. Then we got destroyers that are smaller and faster. And then we have destroyer escorts which are even smaller, and it's still a warship. Uh, but so I guess it's still got guns and things. Uh, but uh, why? They were like, well, we just need more guns. So let's make an even smaller, faster boat. Uh, and, and what are we going to call it? Well, it still is a destroyer, but it's a little one. So it's escorting. It's, it's just like hanging out next to the other destroyer. I don't know. The next word. Destroying angel and this is an interesting name oh i think it looks like we came across this word previously but we didn't learn what it was it's a great name by the way destroying angel two words noun from circa 1900 any of several very poisonous pure white amanita mushrooms and the species names are amanita verna or amanita Verosa, and the synonym is the word death cap. So we talked about death cap a long time ago, and it probably just said the synonym destroying angel. Maybe. I don't remember. Uh, so, you know, be aware of this. Maybe I'll put a picture on social media at Dictionary Pod, and maybe we'll put a link in the show notes so you can learn about what these look like. And then you should probably stay away from them because they are very poisonous. So don't be stupid. The next word. Destructible. Adjective from circa 1755. Capable of being destroyed. Destructibility is a noun. Is there anything that is not destructible? Would that be undestructible, indestructible, indestructible? Yeah, that's a word we use. Indestructible. I'm watching She-Hulk at the moment. Uh, not literally while I'm recording this. That would be very distracting for everybody. But um, I think largely are Hulks like indestructible? Probably not literally. I mean, first of all, we're dealing with a fantasy world. Second of all... I think that they have some ideas of how they maybe maybe can be killed or skin and penetrated, but uh, yeah, they're largely indestructible. Pretty much everything else is destructible. You can destroy it in some way. Destructibility is a noun. I don't remember if I said that. You got it two times, maybe. The next word. Destruction. Noun from the 14th century, one the state or fact of being destroyed. And the synonym is the word ruin. It's in something has been destroyed, it was destructible, and then it got destroyed, and it is in a state of destruction. Two, the action or process of destroying something. Destruction. Three, a destroying agency. What sort of agency is this? Is it a company that you can hire to destroy things and they are a destruction? No, I feel like this. I mean, yes, you can do that. You can hire a company to to blow up buildings if, if you're done with the buildings. But uh, I don't know exactly what this destroying agency would be. Um, yeah, I think the etymology is pretty much the same as what we've been seeing so, the next word, destructionist, noun from 1833, one who delights in or advocates destruction. They love destruction, big fans of destruction. They just want to see everything destroyed. Maybe the Joker would be a destructionist. Um, is this a specific ideology? Do they have rules? Do they have things? Do they have meetings? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, why? That's the maybe the biggest question. Why do you delight in or advocate destruction? Um, are you just so s mad about uh, at everything in the world, the people, the stuff out there? Um, 
I can solidly say that I am not a destructionist, although I do think that there are some things that should be destroyed either physically or, you know, um, systems that are in place. So, yeah, but I I don't want to see everything destroyed. The next word, destructive, adjective from the 15th century, one, causing destruction. The synonym is ruinous, as in destructive storm. Sometimes we do get destructive storms. I mean, luckily we're not in Tornado Alley or where the hurricanes are, but uh, we do just recently even, we got a really, really big storm and uh, we had a bunch of trees down. There was a tree just a couple blocks away that was like tipped over and leaning on a condo and yeah, a lot, a lot of other things. So um, it was it was very destructive. That's what I'm trying to say. Two, designed or tending to hurt or destroy, as in destructive criticism. So if Somebody is a movie critic, and they criticize a movie in a destructive way, then they are really, really trying to hurt the person's feelings who made it, all the people who made it. Uh, Maybe they're trying to destroy their reputation, destroy their career, and um, that just feels like if you didn't like a movie, maybe just don't, just don't go that far. Just say, I didn't like it. It wasn't for me. Destructively is an adverb, and destructiveness is a noun. Next. Destructive distillation. Two words, noun from circa 1831. Decomposition of a substance, as wood, coal, or oil, by heat in a closed container and collection of of the volatile products produced. So if it's an organic substance, it looks like that, wood, coal, oil, you put it in a closed container and you heat it up real good and uh, and then it's going to uh, decompose. It's going to maybe get all heated up and fall apart, decompose, and, uh, and then there's volatile products that are produced. D- destructive distillation... Do you put it in with a thing, uh, like with a with another substance? I'm not sure. And what? Why do you do this? What sort of things do you do this to? Other than wood, coal, or oil, uh, is there a specific case that you need to do destructive distillation to these things? I don't know. I feel like there's there's a lot more information that we need. Maybe we'll put it in the show notes for destructive distillation. Next, destructivity, or just destructivity, destructivity, destructivity. Okay, we said it enough. Noun from 1902, capacity for destruction. Capacity for, what's your, how much destructivity do you have? Thanos, in the Avengers movies and things, he had a lot of destructivity because he wanted to get rid of 50% of the universe's population of living things. Sorry, it's the, I just give you examples of things that I know, and I don't know a lot of things, but I know some things, and I hope you know them well enough to appreciate it. I don't know, maybe you're learning something new. I do, I need to learn more about things, which is why I'm doing this podcast. There is one more word for this episode... It is desuetude, 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 D-E-S-U-E-T-U-D-E, noun from the 15th century, discontinuance from use or exercise, and the synonym is disuse. I feel like that's the one that we use a way more, disuse. We don't really say Des- desuetude so much but um if you're just not using it anymore it's uh what is this it's a noun it's a it's a desuetude 
Let's see. The et- etymology. It is Latin from the Latin desuescere, which means to become unaccustomed, which is from de plus suescere, which means to become accustomed. <laughs> so the desuescere with the de means to become unaccustomed. The word without the de is to become accustomed. It is akin to the Latin sodalis, which means comrade. And there's more at the word sib, S-I-B. So if you are not accustomed to using a thing anymore, it's in disuse, maybe disrepair. It is a desuetude. There's probably some clothes that I have that are desuetude. Probably some other things that I should probably get rid of. Uh, Yeah, God, maybe we do some spring cleaning or something. The words that we had today were destitute, destitution, distress, destrier, uh, destroy, destroyer, destroyer escort, destroying angel, destructible, destruction, destructionist, destructive, destructive distillation, destructivity, and desuetude. Lots of, lots of things getting destroyed in this episode. Uh, so, I did appreciate the name of Destroying Angel, but I'm going to have to pick de-stress as the word of the episode. Whatever you can do to de-stress is good. As long as it's not messing up with some other people, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do it for yourself. Um, but also, there are things that people do to de-stress that can be excessive. If you do it too much, it could be a problem. I'm specifically thinking about alcohol. So I would say that should be the last thing on your list to use to de-stress. Meditation, I would say, would be the first on the list. There's a lot of other things. Just, you know, do those things. Um, But it's, it's, I cannot stress how, (laughs) funny, I cannot stress how important it is to to do this for yourself because stress on the body and the brain and the mind will really, really do a number on it. So it's very important, I think, to uh, get in a habit every day of doing something at least once a day to, uh, to get your mind back to a good place because we all get incredibly stressed out every day between work and finances and partners and kids and families and life, politics, oy, 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 all those things, uh, and more. So, let's de-stress, let's de-stress our bodies and minds. I'm trying to say minds instead of brain because I feel like a brain is a thing, but a mind is sort of a different thing. I don't know. I like to de-stress, that's the de-stress song, we did it. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer. Can we say this in a de-stressful way? This is Spencer, dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This is The Dictionary. Dictionary, dictionary. Um, okay, so all, the, all the, the things, the pluggy things. Uh, social media is at Dictionary Pod on Twitter and Instagram, and please rate and review this show, please, please, please. The algorithms really need your data to put the thing in there to to make this show, put it up in the charts, and for people to know about it, and for the things to say, hey, go check out this show, please and thank you. Five stars, write about the show, write about your favorite word in any language you want, or just anything else, really. Um, there is merchandise. T public link is in the show notes. There is a Google voice number. You can message it. You can call it and leave a voicemail and uh, just say some things and then maybe I'll put it in an episode. Email is dictionarypod at gmail.com. Uh, there's a Facebook page. There's a TikTok at Speedjampar. The personal Twitter and Instagram is at Speedjampar2. Uh, this whole Twitter thing, I don't know, a lot of people are leaving, a lot of people are getting fired, I don't know if I want to use it, I might still use it for a little bit, uh, and just sort of see how this all plays out, but, uh, hmm, yeah, I don't know, it's not, it's not looking great. 
All right, we have to read the words last section of 339. That's the page number. The first word is desulfurization. D E S U L F U R I Z A T I O N. Noun from 1854. The removal of sulfur or sulfur compounds, as from coal or flue gas. Flue gas. So you're taking the sulfur or the sulfur compounds out of things like coal or flue gas. Uh, I don't know enough about sulfur to know why they do this uh, or how, obviously. No clue. I'm not a uh, desulfurinizationer. I don't do, I don't desulfurize things in my uh, spare time. This is what I do in my spare time. This podcast is my spare time thing. Desulfurize is a transitive verb. Maybe we should put a link in the show notes about the desulfurization process so you can learn how to do it in your garage. The next word, oh, the sound effect, uh, it's going to be like a chakunk. Sure, that's something different. The next word is desultory or desultory. D E S U L T O R Y. Adjective from 1581, one, marked by lack of definite plan, regularity, or purpose, as in, a dragged-out ordeal of desultory shopping. That is from Herman Wouk, or Wouk, or Woke, W-O-U-K is how you spell that name. So what is this? Uh, definite plan, regularity, purpose, but there's none of that. So a dragged out ordeal of desultory shopping means uh, you're, you're just going shopping, but you have no plan. You have there's no real purpose. You're just wandering the the aisles uh, haphazardly, or maybe you're going through them in order. But you just you're like I don't know what I'm looking for. I'll know it when I see it. I don't have a list of things, but I know I need to do some shopping. So let's just go around. And, and get the stuff that I find. And maybe, maybe I'll find some gems that I didn't even know that I needed or wanted. This is a desultory shopping trip. My brain can't do that. I need a plan. I need a list. My wife, Sharon, is like, here's the things that we need. And I say, okay, I'll get them. And I go up and down and I know where they are. And I get out quick. And I, I don't, uh, I'm not a big fan of desultory shopping trips. Two, not connected with the main subject not connected with the main subject it is d disconnected deconnected detached it's desultory three disappointing in progress performance or quality as in a desultory fifth place finish well if you're the fifth best person in that race then that's not disappointing but if people were expecting you to win or maybe get silver, then yes, that would be a desultory finish. It's, it's, I'm very disappointed in you that you got fifth place. Come on, you can do better than that. Also is in a desultory wine. Maybe it's been sitting around for a while and it uh, maybe turned into vinegar a little bit, or it's just not as good as you were expecting. Maybe it was $30, and you were like, well, this tastes more like a $5 wine. I am very uh, desultory. Toward, I've been desultored. I don't know. The other forms are desultorily, that's an adverb, and desultoriness. Desultoriness. I have so much desultoriness about this wine. Desultoriness is a noun. This is from the Latin desultorius, which literally means, okay, get ready for this one. Of a circus rider who leaps from horse to horse. So, back in the time when Latin was being spoken, they had circuses with horse riders, and there would be a rider who leapt from horse to horse. And that's what this... Okay, there's more to the etymology. There is a verb, desilire, which means to leap down, and that is from de plus salire, which means to leap and there's more at the word Sally. Okay. So leaping and then leaping down 
and then Desultorius is leaping from horse to horse. That's a very fun image. Um, I am leaping from horse to horse. I am Desultorius. So how is that connected to the, these definitions? Marked by lack of definite plan, regularity, or purpose? It's just, I don't know. There's no plan. We're just leaping. Horse to horse leaping. Horse leaping. Leaping with the horses. That's, that's a fascinating word. The next word. That was the end of the D-E-S section. Here comes the D-E-T section. Chikonk. Debt. Abbreviation for one, detached or detachment. Two, detail or detail. You can emphasize that both ways. Three, determine. Okay, the next word is the first definition of that abbreviation. Chikonk. Detach or detach. This one is a transitive verb from 1686. One, to separate, especially from a larger mass and usually without violence or damage. So, you, you didn't need to use violence to detach this thing from the larger thing. Maybe it just unhinges easily, detaches easily. You just flip a switch and it comes apart. It's a detach. You don't have to destroy anything. Two, synonyms are disengage and withdraw. Detachability is a noun. I don't know why that's not its own word, detachable. Uh, Detachability, noun, detachable, adjective, detachably, adverb. I guess for detachable, it literally should just be like able to be detached and they didn't feel like that was necessary. Although we have, I feel like we have seen stuff like that here. Um, anything is, de- what's detachable? What is detachable? Um, something easy to come off of another thing. I don't know. I'm looking at like these plugs. I have this audio plug into this recorder. I don't know if I would call that detachable. I mean, you just pull it out. What else? Anything in here in this room? Oh, the back of my air conditioner. It's it's one of those air conditioners that sits on the floor and the hose that goes to the window uh, it, it attaches to the back of the air conditioner, and then I think you just do a little rotation, and then you pull it off. And so, yes, that air conditioner hose is detachable, and I can detach it if I want to, but I don't want to. You can't make me. And I will not be destroying it. There's no violence involved in detaching that hose. This is from Old French... Destachier, which is de plus tachier, which is similar to attachier. I don't know, maybe they would say attachier, attachier. And that means to attach. So yeah, it's uh, it's just putting the de to make it the opposite, to detach. That's, that's all the stuff for that one, except for this next word, chikonk, detached with an ed. Something has been detached. Adjective from circa 1706. One, standing by itself. The synonyms are separate and unconnected, especially not sharing any wall with another building, as in a detached house. It's not a townhouse. It's not a condo. It's not a duplex. It's its own house. The next house over is not connected by walls or hoses or tubes or anything like that. Although that would be kind of fun to make those big hamster tubes between houses. Maybe if you buy the house next to you and then you can go through the hamster tubes. That Oh, yeah. Okay, That I let's do that. Uh, it's just separate. It's detached. Not connected to anything else. Two, exhibiting an aloof objectivity usually free from prejudice or self-interest, as in a detached observer. So they are objective. They don't have a horse in this game. Uh, Maybe a journalist for a reputable 
uh, news place or magazine or newspaper or whatever, uh, they have to be detached because they're just here to tell the story in an objective way. No prejudice or self-interest. I mean, they personally may have some feelings, but to do their job as a reporter, a journalist, in the correct way, they have to be detached. Synonym for all is the word indifferent. Detachedly is an adverb. Detachedness, detachedness. Either way to say that is fine. That is a noun. Detachedness. What's the detachedness of that reporter? They are indifferent because they don't care about the outcome. No etymology. Moving on to... Detached service. Two words. Noun from 1835. Military service away from one's assigned organization. I don't know much about the military service, so I'm not completely uh, sure about what this is exactly. Um, well, I, I, I would assume that your assigned organization... Well, that's, the word organization is confusing me. There's, there's, You get to assign to a place... You have to go to a place and stay there and do things and train and fight maybe or whatever. And then maybe a, a detached service is when you get sent to another place. Or if you're assigned to a group, would it be army, navy, whatever? And then you get you go away to maybe a different organization? I don't think that happens, does it? Detached service. Maybe we need to put a link in the show notes so we can learn more about it because... I'm sure it's not complicated in any way, but the the, the definition c- could use a little more information, maybe. An example? I don't know. There's a lot of extra space that they could have put it in. Okay. The next word. Shukunk. Detachment. Noun from 1669. One. The action or process of detaching. The synonym is separation. When I think of these, I also uh, think of, you know, in addition to air conditioner tubes, which everybody thinks of, I also think of ships, spaceships in movies and TV shows, you know, sci-fi things where there's a big ship and then there's a little ship that gets attached to it so they can walk around. I mean, you know, this isn't a sci-fi thing. We have the International Space Station and there are ships that go up to that and have to attach and then detach. This is real life. Um, So detachment is the action of detaching. Let's do a detachment so we can go home. 2A. The dispatch of a body of troops or part of a fleet from the main body for a special mission or service. So there's a whole bunch of troops going into a fighting situation, but then a smaller group gets pulled aside and they're like, hey, you know, we we need you for this uh, special mission. Are you into it? Oh, yeah, I I, I would like to go do this special mission. What are we going to do? Oh, you know, we just need to go buy some some candy for the troops. Ooh, that's the best special mission. To be the part so dispatched. So that would be the group of the military... Uh, who who is going to do a detachment is called the detachment. To see, a permanently organized separate unit, usually smaller than a platoon, and of special composition. They are composed of very special people. Yeah, still very very similar idea, but there but this one's permanent, permanently organized separate unit. 3A, indifference to worldly concerns. The synonym is aloofness. You don't care about what's going on in the world. You're aloof to all that stuff. You're just focused on your own stuff. And, uh, you know, I think uh, I think that there's pros and cons to that. Uh, I think that it is good to learn about the world and know what's going on. And at the same time, uh, I feel like... Uh, it can cause some unneeded stress potentially, but if you want there to be change in the world, then you really probably should know what's going on. 
Uh, but you know what? You can go back and forth. You can say, okay, for this time period, maybe this day, I don't want to know what's going on. I need a day to myself. I'm going to, I'm going to have some detachment. 3B, freedom from bias or prejudice. Hmm, bias or prejudice. That's, that's probably hard to do. I think everybody has at least some level of bias. It's hard to be detached completely. The next word, jagunk, is the last word, and we got two forms. It's the word detail or detail, D-E-T-A-I-L. So the first form is a noun from 1603. We got a lot of information here. One, extended treatment of or attention to particular items. You, you are paying very, very close attention to very certain things, uh, and you are giving it extended treatment. Number two, a part of a whole. So you got a whole thing. What's an example of this part of a whole? Well, we have 2A, a small and subordinate part. The synonym is the word particular. So it's just a very, very tiny little part of a whole thing is the detail or a detail. But also, for 2A, a reproduction of such a part of a work of art. So maybe there's just a little piece of a piece of art, a piece of a piece of art, and then the the reproduction of that piece of art is the detail. It's the detail, yeah. we You know, maybe it's you take a photo of a small part and we call that the detail because sometimes you want to see those little details of the brush marks the brush strokes how did they do a thing yeah it's the the detail of the art uh to be a part considered or requiring to be considered so a part considered or requiring to be considered separately from the whole Mm, maybe a slice of bread would be the detail of the loaf, and you have to consider it separate because you usually just grab one or two pieces of bread. Speaking of, I want some, I want a grilled cheese or toast or something. 2C, the small elements that collectively constitute a work of art. Ooh, you know, sometimes they create art out of a whole bunch of, like, trash and junk and things, and they put it all together, and so if you look at it at the right angle, it looks like a person's face or a thing. And so every single one of those pieces would be considered a detail, and then they come together as a whole to create a work of art. 2D, the small elements of a photographic image corresponding to those of the subject. Um, so what is the subject of the photograph? And I guess maybe that subject can be made up of smaller elements, the details, the details. Can't, can't really give you a great example of that one. 3A, selection of a person or group for a particular task, as in a military service. Uh, selection of a group of... So, yeah, um, maybe this detail is being detached so they can do a detachment for that special candy mission. 3B1, the person or group selected is the detail. We have, yeah, I think I've heard of this before. Hey, we got you on uh, a detail service. Uh, What do they say? We, We have a special detail mission. I don't know how it's put in context. 3B2, the task to be performed, is also called the detail. Yeah. A synonym is just the word item, just a, a thing, an item of a, of a larger thing. There's a phrase in detail, which means with all the particulars. That's it. With all the particulars is in detail. As in the example explained the job in detail. I do like it when somebody explains something to me in detail. If I have to go perform this job, this action, or just in general, I want to know the details. I don't 
I don't want the, the general idea. I love the details. Give me all the stuff, the particulars. They explain the job with all of the particulars. Bonk. Oh, 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 rewind. Uh, etymology. From Fre- Old French, detail. It's the same word, but they pronounce it differently. Detail. Uh, that means slice or piece, which is from detailier, detailier, which means to cut in pieces, which is from day plus talier. I don't know how to pronounce it. Talier means to cut. So you put the D-E and you're cutting it into pieces. This is my last resort. And there's more of the word tailor. Ah, interesting. The tailor is cutting pieces of fabric, putting it all together. That's where that word comes from. Slices, pieces, details. Ho ho. Can you be a detailer when you're focused on just the small little pieces and not the whole suit or dress or overalls or pants, socks, hat? The next word, chikonk. Second form of detail. And uh, I guess it's both pronunciations still for this one. This, although I could change that, uh, this is a transitive verb from 1650. One, to report minutely and distinctly. The synonym is specify, as in detailed their grievances. So there I pronounced it with the emphasis on the first syllable, which I think made sense. Detailed their grievances. They were talking about their grievances in very very small detail, all the little tiny bits of the grievances, all the minutia in a very specific way. Two, to assign to a particular task. I'm going to detail you to that detail service, which is a detail. Three, to furnish with the smaller elements of design and finish, as in trimmings, that detail slips and petticoats. Um, so, uh, what? The slips and petticoats, those are clothes, and then you, you're detailing it with all the things, the smaller things, to, to finish it up, um, so it's a, a full piece in the end. I think maybe I said that right? Not sure. Four... Um, Oh, I think I said this all was transitive. This word is a verb. We just started with transitive because we do have one intransitive coming up. So number four, transitive verb for detail, to clean out and refurbish very thoroughly and meticulously. And the example of the thing that you are cleaning or refurbishing is a vehicle, as in detail a car. I think this is probably a good thing to do every once in a while. I know some people do this. I don't know if I've ever actually gotten a car detailed. Maybe once. I don't remember. But uh, yeah, you know, the inside, it it gets dirty. Lots and lots and lots of things are gross in there. So you got to get somebody to come in and just, just clean out all the nooks and crannies of your English muffin car. Intransitive says... To make detail drawings. So if you are detailing... Now, would those detail drawings be just a piece, a small section of a piece of art? So you're redrawing what was there, or you are just making drawings that are very detailed with lots... Maybe it's very tiny, uh, intricate designs or something. I don't know. Detailer is a noun, and that is detailer with an E-R at the end, opposed to the detailer with an O-R at the end, which I made up because that is a person who makes very small detailed clothing, and that is not definitely not in the book. So, okay. The words today, what were they? They were desulfurization, desultory, Debt, detach, detached, detached service, detachment, detail, and detail or detail. 
Um, you know, I like the details of things. I like uh, something that's uh, very small and intricate, and I've actually made some art that was very uh, detailed. Oh, but I think... I don't know. I think between just between the, the definitions that I thought were kind of interesting, and especially the etymology, I'm still confused about this word, uh, but I have to pick desultory as the word of the episode. D-E-S-U-L-T-O-R-Y. Leaping from horse to horse, lacking a plan, not connected to anything, uh disappointing in progress i don't know it's a it's an interesting word not sure how to use it or if i ever will use it or anything like that desultory is a confusing word i don't know what it means but i definitely will use it when i'm leaping from horse to horse i don't know there there's no melody to that song can we come up with something better desultory is a confusing word when I go leaping from horse to horse, I will say it's desultory. All right, at least that was semi-melodic. Oh, that's the end of the episode. Real quick, I will say that last night my wife and I watched Weird, the Al Yankovic story. And even if you don't know anything about him, I do highly recommend it just because it's just pure silliness. And oh, I just loved it so much. And um, can't wait to watch it again. And uh, let's see what happens. What what else is he going to do with his career? Um, I don't think he's going to be focusing on music quite as much, or at least specifically parody songs, creating them. Uh, I think he's got a lot of other projects in mind. And he has he's done a lot. He's paid his dues. He's been doing this for 40 years and uh, more, more than 40 years. And uh, he deserves to uh, just, just do whatever he wants. He probably doesn't have to do anything anymore. Uh, But yes, if you don't know anything about him, watch the movie, listen to his music, just just learn all about him. He he is uh, the type of person that we all should strive to be like. Okay, that is definitely the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this episode of the podcast called The Dictionary. Hey, ho, how do you do? What is up with you and you and you? Uh, You know, okay, let's just get into the words. You don't have to say something new every single episode. There's one every single day. This podcast is airing every single day. So let's talk about the words. The first word in this first section of page 340 is either pronounced detailed or detailed. D-E-T-A-I-L-E-D. Adjective from 1740. Marked by abundant detail or by thoroughness in treating small items or parts, as in the detailed study of history. They're studying history very, very, very detailed. There's lots and lots of detail, very thorough. It's like when you get your car detailed, you're cleaning out all of the little pieces, and so you're going through history with a fine-tooth comb and learning about all the different little pieces of history. A synonym is the word circumstantial, detailedly, or detailedly, detailedly, or detailedly, yeah, adverb, both forms of that are adverb, Uh, and detailedness, or detailedness, that is a noun. It's just all about the details, all about the details. Okay, let's do a sound effect that we have not come up with ahead of time. So let's go... <laughs> the next word is detailing, with an I-N-G. Noun from 1970, the act or process of meticulously cleaning and refurbishing an automobile. Detailing, get it detailed. Maybe if you're trying to sell it, you got to go take it to a detailer... And so they can 
they just got to clean all the stuff, make it nice and pretty and fancy and, uh, I was going to say wrinkly, that's not the word, shiny, make it shiny, as shiny as possible. The next word is detail man. Two words. It's a man who is very focused on the details. Noun from 1928. A sales representative of a drug manufacturer who introduces new drugs, especially to physicians and pharmacists. It does not say why they are called a detail man. Maybe it's because they knew all the details of the drug. You got to be, if you're going to be a salesperson for a drug for a pharmaceutical company, you need to know all of the details. First of all, what is the drug called? That's a pretty important name to know, a, th- a detail to know. What does the drug do? What what uh, disease or thing does it does it help with? Um, what is the information in the clinical trials that they did? Have they done clinical trials? If not, I don't want it. But if they did, do some trials. What's the data? What does it say? How does it compare to the competitors? I... Uh, I'm curious when they stopped using this phrase, detail man, if they stopped. I mean, this this term is o- almost 100 years old. I mean, now it's just salesperson, sales rep, that kind of thing. The next word is detain or detain. This is a verb, and it looks like it's just transitive. From the 15th century, one to hold or keep in or as if in custody, as in detained by the police for questioning. You are probably in a police department where you are being detained. Maybe you got handcuffs on you. You're sitting at a table with a two-way or a one-way mirror. Two-way mirror? One-way mirror? Three-way mirror? Which ways? How many ways does that mirror go? Uh, That is detain. Um, I was never detained, but I was almost, (laughs) almost arrested. It was a mistake. They were not looking for me. They were looking for somebody else. My friend and I, we, they were sort of leaning up, uh, leaning us up against a car, uh, because they thought that we were the bad people and we were not, luckily we did not get handcuffed. Uh, but that was not a fun situation. Number two for detain is obsolete. To keep back. To keep back. Uh, As something due. If something is due, but you are keeping it back, you are detaining it. The synonym is withhold. So maybe you got a library book that's due back to the library, but you are going to hold it at home for longer than you should. Hmm. Yeah, this is this does see. I, I technically it makes sense, you know. If a person is being detained by the police, if a book is being detained by you, and you just want to read it more, the idea makes sense. But it's not. Uh, I guess it's not something that we use in this context anymore. Three, to restrain, especially from proceeding, as in was detained by a flat tire. The flat tire said, "Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah! Uh, you cannot proceed. I will detain you here on the side of this highway, where there are cars driving at eighty miles an hour, and you're trying to fix your flat tire." A couple more synonyms for all is the, they are the words "keep" and "delay." Detainment is a noun. This is from uh, the Latin detenere which is from day plus tenere which means to hold there's more of the word thin so yeah if you're holding a thing you are detaining it you it will not be released from your grip it's being detained in your hand or whatever other body part you're holding it with the next word is detainee or detainee is that Detainee, detainee. The last syllable is emphasized noun from circa 1928. A person held in custody 
especially for political reasons. And we might have to talk a bit more about this after the next word, which is detainer with an E-R at the end. Noun from 1619, one. The act of keeping something in one's possession, specifically, the withholding from the rightful owner of something that has lawfully come into the possession of the holder. That was a lot. So, uh, just keeping keeping something in your possession, it's a detainer. Uh, but this specifically was somebody is a rightful owner of a thing, uh, and they've lawfully come into the possession of the holder, so that's a detainer. Hmm. I've heard of, re- of a retainer, That's but that's a different thing. You could have like a lawyer on retainer, but th- this is different. Number two... Detention in custody is called detainer. You got, how how do you use this in a sentence? It's the noun, it's a detainer. Detention in custody. So do you go to detainer? Do you have a detainer? Are you doing a detainer? Not, I'm not sure how to use it in that context in a sentence. What's number three say? A writ, W-R-I-T, a writ authorizing the keeper of a prison to continue to hold a person in custody. So this sounds like it's a document that says, yeah, you got to keep on holding them. You can't let them out. Please don't let them out. Keep them there where we can watch them. None of these, none of these was about the person who is doing the detaining. I thought that maybe we would see that there, but I guess not. Um, so the first thing that I think of when I hear the word detainer is, or just, uh, no, just detain in general, is, um, when all of those people who were trying to cross the border got detained, the families and the kids, and the kids were all by themselves and they were taken from their families. And, uh, that was a really bad and heart wrenching situation. And I don't know what what has happened to it has any of it been resolved i mean they didn't have records of whose kids went where or whose parents went where and these kids were so young that if they were separated from their families their parents for just a little bit of time like they might forget who their parents are if they end up getting reunited with them they i think a lot of them went to foster families and uh, you know, oh, it was just, it was very bad. So I think I may have to um, put a link in the show notes just to talk about this a little bit more and see what the updated situation is. I don't know. that. Uh, how can my brain not go to that situation when I hear detain? So many, I don't even know how many people, hundreds, hundreds of people being detained in these friggin' fence cages and in a terrible situation. Yay, I'm, that's, I say that sarcastically, of course. The next word. It is D-E-T-D, abbreviation for determined. Determined, which, uh, when's that going to come? I think that is in, hmm, is it the next episode? Or, no, it's uh, in a couple episodes or so. The next word. Detect. D-E-T-E-C-T. Detect. Verb from 1574, starting with transitive. Number one. Well, I, I couldn't find the intransitive for a second, so I got very confused. Okay, number one for transitive. To discover the true character of. Detect. You are, de- you are like such a good detective figuring out their true character good luck good luck trying to figure out my true character two to discover or determine the existence presence or fact of it's all about just trying to find the truth the truth of a thing detecting it Um, as in detect alcohol in the body so this is a very uh, analytical 
data-driven situation. The existence of alcohol, the presence of alcohol, the fact of alcohol. I don't know if you could say that. You'd probably use that with a different example. What is the truth of the alcohol in your body, in your blood? The blood alcohol content. What's the percentage? Uh, Yeah, we don't need to go down that road. Number three, the synonym is demodulate. Intransitive says to work as a detective is to detect. That makes sense. Detectives detect. Detectability is a noun, and detectable is an adjective. Detectable. Can it be detected? Can we detect the alcohol in the blood? Can we detect the... I don't know where else to go with that. What can you detect? Um, this is from the Latin verb detegere. Detegere, and that means to uncover or detect. And that is from de plus tegere, which means to cover. So if you cover a thing that is tegere, you put the de in front, it is uncover. So what what would be the opposite in English? Um, it's not just tect. I don't think we use that word. Detect is to uncover, to reveal. And so the opposite of that would be to cover up and hide. Um, it does say there is more at the word thatch. So if you're thatching a roof, you're covering the roof up. You're, you're not raising the roof up. You're covering the roof up with stuff. So that's that. That makes sense. But uh, yeah, I can't really think of the opposite of detect in, in the moment right now. The next word. Detection. Noun from the 13th, 15th, 15th century. One, the act of detecting the state or fact of being detected. Number two, the process of demodulating. Hmm... Can't really think of how I'd have to go back to demodulate to to remind myself what exactly are we saying when we say demodulating or demodulate, but uh, detection is similar. Uh, there are things called, well, I guess we can hold on to that for a second. Uh, detection. Yeah, I got nothing else. I got nothing. The next word. Beep beep boop beep boop beep beep boop. Detective. First form adjective from 1732. Detective is an adjective number one, fitted for or used in detecting something, as in, had perfected his detective sensibilities. I think I got to work on my detective sensibilities. I think got to put a little bit more effort into when I'm when I'm looking around in the world and meeting people and just observing the world. I could be a bit better about observing. I observe things okay, but sometimes I don't observe things at all. And uh, maybe I need to uh, just really try and put on my detective hat and think and observe about what, what, can I, what can I deduce from this situation. Number two for detective of or relating to detectives or their work, as in a detective novel. A novel that has been written about a detective. Maybe the book is all in black and white and it's film noir style. I'm not sure how the book can be like that, but maybe it's written that way. Detective like is an adjective. The second form of detective, noun from 1849. One employed or engaged in detecting lawbreakers or in getting information that is not readily or publicly accessible. How do they do that? Well, because they're a police officer, so I guess they have access to things that are not available to the public. What an interesting job to be a detective. You're literally just trying to solve puzzles, basically, especially in like a murder situation. You got to look at all the evidence, look at the, the blood splatter, if there is any, 
look at the footprints, the fingerprints, the and you got to be really, really observant about all the little details in the situation. I wonder if detail and detect, do they have similar etymology? Let's see. No, I don't think so. Uh, nope, that one's about a piece, and this one's about covering or uncovering. So, yeah, but detectives, they look at the details, the details. Would you consider Sherlock Holmes to be a detective? Is that what they say? He's a detective? He's got to be. What else would he be? I think so. That's, for some reason, I'm second-guessing myself on that. Um, detective, anything else? Yeah, you got to get a magnifying glass if you're going to be a detective. These days, though, maybe you got something fancier. The next word. <laughs> Detector. Noun from 1541. One that detects. As a, a device for detecting the presence of electromagnetic waves or of radioactivity. That is a very fancy detector. Uh, the, when you is it a Geiger counter that checks that can that can detect uh, radioactivity? So it's a radioactive activity detector. Uh, yeah, very very important for that specifically. Uh, B. So one that detects as B, a rectifier of high frequency current used especially for extracting the intelligence from a radio signal. What what intelligence are we talking about here that you get from a radio signal? Hmm. That That's interesting. And then, of course, there's a metal detector. Now, I don't think... It wouldn't be uh, electromagnetic waves, but, you know, they, they're somehow able to scan a certain distance into the ground or the sand or whatever it is and uh, can tell you if there is metal and I'm sure there's certain kinds of metals that it can't detect maybe I don't know I think I had one when I was a kid but I don't even know if it really worked Uh, it was pretty cheap so uh, but yeah I've seen people at the beach just going up and down with a metal detector and then they they get stuff you get coins you get I'm, I'm sure you're always looking for that that big, big find. The next word is detent or detent. Noun from 1688. And this is a device as a catch, dog, or spring-operated ball for positioning and holding one mechanical part in relation to another in a manner such that the device can be released by force applied to one or the parts, one of the parts. Still uh, didn't help me. So maybe if this looks interesting, I'll see if I can find a picture and post this on social media, a, a detent. It is from the French, the Middle French, destendre, destendre which means to slacken. From the Old French, de plus tendre, which means to stretch. Uh, so you're stretching a thing, and then if you put the de in front, you're, uh, I guess you're undoing the stretchiness. You're, you're letting go, and it's, uh, it's slack, it's loose, right? Also from the Latin tendere, which it does not say what that means, but it might be something to do with stretching. And there's more at the word thin, if you're thin, maybe you look like you're stretched out. So something about stretching. Well, there is a spring-operated ball, and those get kind of stretchy. Um, so you use it for positioning and holding a mechanical thing in relation to another one. It can be released and the force applied. So, yeah, uh, uh, is this for a, a car? A, but there's a ball. There's a spring-operated ball or a dog. A dog. Can a dog be a device? What dog? Dog? Hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. I maybe will also need to post a picture, uh, post a link in the show notes for detent, because this is very confusing if you don't know what it is. The last word in this episode. (laughs) 
You sorry, you just have to deal with this nonsense. This word is detente. Emphasis on the second syllable. It is spelled D E T E N T E. And you can put an accent on the very first E that goes boop or or no accent. That's fine too. Detente. Noun from 1908. One. The the relaxation of strained relations or tensions as between nations. Also, a policy promoting this. So there are countries who have strained relations because why? Because maybe they fought each other in the past, they don't like each other, they don't agree with each other. Who knows? Who knows why? I think they should just forget about this and everybody just be cool. But for whatever reason, they got some tension They need a massage therapist to get rid of this tension. But this word, when you relax those tensions, maybe the the leaders, maybe they have a little chit-chat and they say, oh, well, we don't don't need to have all these tensions between our countries. Let's relax them. Let's have a detente. Let's do that. That's a good idea. Israel-Palestine, how can we get you a detente? Russia-Ukraine? Let's have a detente. Uh, number two is a period of detente. So that that time period, long or short, hopefully it's forever, that is a detente. Let's do a detente so there's no, no strain tensions. There is no etymology other than just saying it's French. So it probably means, I don't know. What, well, actually, if we go to the previous word, detent, That's about uh, slackening, slackening a thing, so loosening it. And so that kind of makes sense. We're we're loosening the tensions. Ah, a detente is when you do see that massage therapist and everything has been detented. That's not a real word. I just made it up. Okay. Let's reread the words and come up with the word of the episode. Today we had detailed, detailing, detail man, detain, detainee, detainer, detted, detect, detection, detective, detector, detent, and detente. Ooh, I think I may pick detective as the word of the episode. I think it's a fascinating job. You gotta, you gotta know a lot and learn a lot and... Yeah, be observant. I don't know if I could ever be a detective, but I do think it is a really interesting job of like you're you're literally like figuring out puzzles and things. You know, there there are detectives, uh, there are p- people who probably aren't doing quite as much of that. It's more about you know, just just getting the the people arresting the people. Um but yeah, this one is specifically, yeah, detecting lawbreakers or getting the information. So, so, that means we have to sing a song about detective. Detectives are really, really smart. I don't like this song. I don't like where it's going. Let's start over. I could just sing the word. That's fine. You don't need to add more words and make your life harder. Detective, detective, oh yeah, detective, 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 they've got a magnifying glass. Think you should take these and just make them better. Remix, maybe? Expand, expand to the full thing? Okay, we gotta end this. I will quickly say, um, there is a movie called something about WNUF TV special something it's a it's a comedy movie a bit in the horror world um and it takes place in the 80s and it was made recently by some very creative filmmakers uh it, it includes old commercials that are all fake and new but made to look like they were from back in the day it's so very clever but the reason i bring it up is because uh, we just watched this sequel in a theater um, which is called, I can never remember the name. It doesn't say WNUF in there, but I think if you look up WNUF, you'll find it. It was just made, came out this year, 2022. And uh, 
and the filmmaker and his wife were there, who's the lead actress. And so they did a QA, and a and then I got to talk to them at the end. And they're super nice and great. And they largely made this second movie by themselves uh, during the pandemic, uh, just on his own. He shot a lot of things on his own with actors, of course. Uh, he was often a one-person crew. He did a lot of the post-production himself, I think. Uh, I'm just really, really impressed with the, just the creativity and the geniusness of what they were able to pull together. The second one is a lot more comedic, I think, than horror. Uh, I feel like the first one has more horror than the second one. But uh, but yeah, no, they're just super, super fun and uh, and definitely worth checking out. Okay, I think that's probably all for today. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. What what a wonderful day it is to have you listening to me. This is fantastic. The first word in this episode is detention. And uh, let's see. I'm just looking ahead a little bit. Yeah, we just have a little bit, little bit of these this detention section. D e t e n t i o n. Noun from the 15th century. One. The act or fact of detaining or holding back, especially a holding in custody. The act or fact of detaining or holding back, or we can shorten it to the act or fact of holding back. Kind of rhymes. Two, the state of being detained, especially a period of of temporary custody prior to disposition by a court. And we usually think of detention with, uh, with, with somebody at school. You do a bad thing, and then the teacher says, or the principal says, you got detention after school today, or come in on Saturday, or you get it for a month, whatever the case is. But you're, you're being held in custody, which is really just in a classroom. And... Um, Maybe you can do your homework. Maybe you can't do your homework. I don't know. I don't know if I've ever had detention. Hmm. I was a very good kid. I definitely did not break the rules. Uh, I feel like there was one time, did I? I don't think I quite got detention, but I feel like there was something in high school. I can't really remember. But uh, yeah. And then, of course, there's that classic 80s movie that a lot of people have problems with these days, uh, The Breakfast Club. And they, they're in detention for all day on a Saturday. And they're all very sad about it. But yeah, there are some problems in that movie for sure. This is from the Latin detenere, which I think we had that in the previous episode. Uh, same word, yeah, detenere. That means to detain. Um, Detain? The kids are being detained in the school. Oh no, they hate it. The next word, um, and uh, what, oh yeah, I'll do, sound effect will be, whoa, I don't know, something like that, we'll play with it, whoa, the next word is detention home, two words, noun from circa 1930, a house of detention for juvenile delinquents, usually under the supervision of of a juvenile court. So I guess if you're younger than 18, I think that's what we consider a juvenile to be. I wonder if it was different in the 1930s. Anyway, if you're under 18 and you did something uh, illegal that you had to go to court for, it was pretty bad probably, uh, because you're young, you don't have to go to jail, but you still need to be punished in some way. So I guess, I guess instead of jail or prison, there's a, a house, a home, that's uh, called a detention home, and that you go stay there, and uh, I don't know, I don't know, let's let's uh, put a link in the show notes, so you can learn more about detention homes, what exactly was involved with them, were there police officers who would live there too with you, how did it work, was it minimum security, would you be handcuffed, not sure, and I don't, I don't know if this is a thing anymore, the next word, whoa, deter, or deter, deter. 
This is a transitive verb from circa 1547. 1. To turn aside, discourage, or prevent from acting. So in, in whatever way, you're just stopping a thing from happening, deterring it. As in, she would not be deterred by threats. The threats were trying to prevent her from doing things. But she said, no, no, you shall not deter me, deter, deter me. I shall still do my, my acts. Number two, the synonym is inhibit, as in painting to deter rust. We don't want the rust. You paint the metal, so maybe the rust won't come. Go away, rust. If it's already rusted, though, the paint is not going to get rid of the rust. So think about that. Determent is a noun. Deterability is a noun. And deterrable is an adjective. If something can be stopped... It is deterrable. It's, uh, or dis discouraged, prevented from acting. I'm sure you all would like to deter me from keeping on doing this podcast, but I am not deterred by your threats. This is from the Latin deterere, deterere, which is from de plus terere, which means to frighten. And there's more at the word terror. Hmm. So, but it does not say what de terere means. So it could just be the same as terere to frighten. And uh, yeah, I, you know, if I if I am frightened by something, if I am walking down the street and something frightens me, I might be deterred from walking down that street ever again. I might turn around and run away, going. Aah! That's what I might do. The next word. Whoa. Deterge. Deterge? Deterge? Something like that. D-E-T-E-R-G-E. -E -E. Deterge. Transitive verb from circa 1623. To wash off. And the synonym is cleanse. Deterger. <laughs> Deterger is a noun. I think you can see where this is going. Uh, this is from the Latin detergere, which is from de plus tergere, which means to wipe. Yes, to wipe. But I think, again, it doesn't say what detergere means, so it may also mean wipe or something similar. Um, yeah, so... Um, I thought there was something else about that deter. It's a very silly word to say, deterge, uh, and then de deterged and deterging, deterging. Those are other forms of it. This leads us right into the next word. Wow, detergency, noun from 1710, cleansing quality or power, cleansing quality or power. How much cleansing quality does that hand soap have? Is it very powerful or not? Is it, does it have a lot of detergency? Hopefully, you want to get clean. You want that antibacterial stuff. You don't want to be spreading around the germs. If you blow your nose, wash your hands. Any excuse to say something like that. The next word. Wow. Detergent. First form, adjective from 1616. Yeah, this is obviously where we were going when we heard deterge and cleanse and deterger. Uh, so detergent, the adjective, just says that cleanses. The synonym is cleansing, as in a detergent oil. So I guess it's an oil that cleans things, cleanses things. What sort of oil is that? I don't know. I don't know my oils. I know there's olive oil, and I don't think that cleanses things. There must be something in there, in the oil, that uh, breaks apart things. Yeah. You know the oil that you put in your car? Not not a cleanser. No. I, I think that's the opposite of a cleanser. The next word. Whoa. Detergent second form. 
noun from 1676. Uh, there is a, a main definition and then A, B, and C. It is a cleansing agent. It is a thing that does the cleansing. Hopefully it's a good one. Don't get a cheap one. As A, the synonym is soap. Soap. Soap is a detergent because it cleanses. You you take that soap and you rub it all over your face and your hair and your armpits and your butt and your feet. And get, get all up in your toes, in between your toes. Clean all the toe jam out. Get in between in 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 between the ears. No, behind the ears. In between the ears is the brain. B. This is a long one. Any of numerous synthetic wa- water soluble or liquid organic preparations that are chemically different from soaps, but are able to emulsify oils, hold dirt in suspension, and act as wetting agents. That was a lot of information, and uh, it's it's uh, it's synthetic. That's an important thing to know. Uh, liquid or water soluble. It's organic, different from soaps. Very important, different from soaps, but can emulsify oils and uh, hold hold dirt in us in suspended animation, and they also wet things. C. An oil-soluble substance that holds insoluble foreign matter in suspension and is used in lubricating oils and dry cleansing solvents. A whole lot of chemistry things that I can't really add to. But uh, it's all about cleansing. Cleansing and cleaning and making it nice. The next word. What? It is deteriorate 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 shall i spell it d e t e r i o r a t e verb from 1572 starting with transitive 1 to make inferior in quality or value the synonym is impair it's less quality has less quality or value than it did before it's impaired it is not as good as it used to be. It has deteriorated. Number two, the synonym is disintegrate. It's just fallen apart into pieces and particles and molecules. That's what deterioration is. Oh, actually, we haven't even gotten to that word yet. Intransitive for deteriorate, to become impaired in quality, functioning, or condition... The synonym is degenerate, as in, allowed a tradition of academic excellence to deteriorate. We used to have academic excellence. It was a tradition for years and years, but, uh, you know, it just sort of fell apart, and it has deteriorated. There's another example. His health deteriorated. Something that will definitely happen to all of us, or not not definitely, will very likely happen to most of us. Um, and uh, that's um, not something that I'm particularly looking forward to. I already feel like it is happening. But it is a fact of life. Unless a bus is going to hit me, uh, my, my body, my health, all of that stuff will deteriorate until I have disintegrated into dust. Deteriorative is an adjective. When do you use that word, deteriorative? This is from the Latin verb deteriorare, which is from deterior, which means worse. So deteriorare probably means to make worse or to be worse, something like that. Um... There's a bunch of information that I do not understand, but basically it's about being worse. There's more at the word weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R, like weather or not, here I come. That's it for deteriorate. Let's talk about the next word. Whoa, deterioration. 
noun from circa 1658, the action or process of deteriorating, and then also the state of being deteriorated. It's deterioration. It's going through the state or process of deteriorating. And there is synonym information. The words are deterioration, degeneration, decadence, and decline. They mean the falling from a higher to a lower level in quality, character, or vitality. Deterioration implies generally the impairment of value or usefulness, as in the deterioration of the house through neglect. Oh, there's a lot of houses I've seen. We go for walks and we look at a house and we say, wow, that, has, that house has really deteriorated. It is in such a state of deterioration. The paint is peeling. It looks like it's abandoned. The stairs are falling apart. You gotta, it's been neglected. You gotta get it fixed up. It's not useful anymore. It doesn't have a value. It doesn't have as much value as it could have. Degeneration stresses physical, intellectual, or especially moral retrogression, as in the degeneration of their youthful idealism into cynicism. So when they were young, they were they had an idealism. They looked at everything with rose-colored glasses. They were so happy about the world. But then as they got older, they realized the truth of life. And it degenerated into cynicism. They were just very angry about everything. I think that, uh, I think my 30s, my 30s were kind of like that. It's like, ooh, I'm just... I'm just not really not happy about a lot of things. But I think I'm coming out of it largely. Um, yeah, moral retrogression. The next word in the synonym section, decadence, presupposes a reaching and passing the peak of development and implies a turn downward with a consequent loss in vitality or energy. As in, cited love of luxury as a sign of cultural decadence. I mean, we had this word before, so you can go back and listen to me talk about that. Same with degeneration. Um, the reaching and passing the peak into, of development and implies a turn downward. Am I reading the right one? Turn downward, the consequent loss of vitality or energy. It's, uh, it's decadent. Yeah, I do kind of remember that. It's, which is weird. I think I mentioned this, that it's, when you have a life of decadence, you think that it's all fancy and gold and rich and everything, but it's it's kind of the opposite. It's a very odd word. Uh, there's one more for the synonyms. Decline differs from decadence in suggesting a more markedly downward direction and greater momentum, as well as more obvious evidence of deterioration, as in the meteoric decline of his career after the scandal. So in this case, the the downward direction is much faster than decadence. It's a very, very quick, very fast decline. Um, and there's more, more, more deterioration. More, 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 more deterioration. I'm not trying to make fun of stuttering people, people with a stutter. That's just sometimes how it comes out. And then to make fun of myself, I have to exaggerate it. Uh, the meteoric decline. I, I feel like I've heard it used in the opposite way. The meteoric rise of his career. Also could it be after the scandal. Maybe after the scandal, he got very famous. Uh, there's no etymology for that because it's similar to the previous word. So we are going to move on to... Whoa, 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 whoa. Determinable. Determinable. Adjective from the 15th century, one, capable of being determined, definitely ascertained, or decided upon. Capable of being determined, capable of being definitely ascertained, or capable of being decided upon. As in, a determinable cause. You can determine, ascertain, or decide on that cause. What cause will that be? Two, 
liable to be terminated. And the synonym is terminable. That's for the word determinable. Same word. Terminable, determinable. As in a determinable estate. So it can potentially be term terminated, ended. The estate will be finished up. It will be sold off. Things will be given away. The money will be gone to all the places. It is determinable. They have determined that they are done with the estate, I guess. Uh, I just read that word terminated, and it made me think very clearly that uh, just reminded me last night we watched Terminator 2, T2, Judgment Day. And uh, I have not seen it for years, but I had watched it quite a number of times in my younger days. And oh, so good. It's so good. I love it. A lot of things that I, you know, watching it as an adult, you see things in different lights. And uh, yeah, a lot of things, I thought about a lot of things that I had never really thought about before. Um, or noticed things or was able to, to process things in a different way. Yeah, it's a good one. Determinab determinableness, determinableness, that is a noun, and determinably is an adverb. And our last word, whoa, whoa, whoa. Determinancy, determinancy, D-E-T-E-R-M-I-N-A-C-Y, noun from 1873, one, the quality or state of being determinate. And that's going to be in the next episode, determinate, or determinate, probably determinate. 2A, the state of being definitely and unequivocally characterized. Synonym is exactness. We want to be very definite with our things when we characterize them. To be the state of being determined or necessitated. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to sort of wrap my brain around this word. I mean, yeah, we'll learn more at determinate. You're determining a thing... It's the quality or state of being determinate. Yeah, it's just about determining things, choosing them, picking them, something like that. All right, let's read the words one more time for this episode so we can all come up with a word of the episode together. And, uh, you know, of course, if you have particular feelings about words, you can call the Google Voice number 917-727-5757. Go ahead, call it, leave a message. Tell me what you think about a word. If you have suggestions for maybe an expert guest on a word that's um, in the future, anytime between now and the end of the alphabet, say, hey, I know a person who would be great to talk about this word. Let me know. Podcast, we could do a podcast swap. I'm just now doing the pluggy things. But uh, basically, yeah, if you want have a word of the episode, if you want to give your own thoughts on something, you could do that. Email dictionarypod at gmail.com social media, at DictionaryPod. All those things are also in the show notes. That was all just to uh, stall for nothing. I didn't do any thinking during that time because I still need to read the words. We had detention, detention home, deter, deterge, detergency, detergent, detergent, deteriorate, deterioration, determinable, determinancy. I don't know if these are connected, but I just made another connection in my own brain between deter and deterge, all about cleansing. And uh, I guess you could make the argument that deterge, detergency, that sort of stuff, detergent, is deterring the dirty things from collecting on the thing that you are trying to clean. Now, obviously, that's not exactly what's happening. You're cleaning off the things. You're not deterring them. You're not stopping them from coming on later. But uh, it's just, you know, you, you, you could maybe make a little bit of a, an argument there to connect those words. Um, so what does that mean that we are going to pick a word of the episode? Which one is it going to be? Um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of detention. People being detained. I don't want to be detained. 
Uh, detention home was, it's an interesting thing. Hmm, I don't know. Ooh, I guess detergent. Yeah, we should probably pick detergent as the word of the episode because it is the thing that cleans our stuff. And we're so very glad for, uh, for scientists and people who can make things that are going to clean our stuff real nice so we're not walking around in our own filth and other dirt. And that's just gross. Speaking of gross, when you flush the toilet, make sure to close the lid. And if you don't have a lid... If you're a business, a house, or whatever, get get a lid for your toilet. So when you flush, not the, the stuff isn't flying around. Because that's just gross. We love detergent. We wash our clothes and our dishes with detergent. Maybe also your hands and your face and your nose in detergent. Detergent. That is going to be the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And you can watch it on YouTube and as you stare at the logo. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye.